Hi. Just checking my mic's working. Um, unfortunately, Anthony Spira is unwell, so I'm doing the intro. Um, we're delighted to welcome everyone, uh, both in person and online. Um, this is the most kind of technically ambitious event that we've held in terms of hybrid. So please do bear with us if there are any technical hiccups, but uh, many thanks to Luke Perry for making this all happen. For everyone who's here in person, we're really pleased you can actually see the show. There are over 160 works borrowed from across the UK. And one of the most frequent compliments is that it provides a unique opportunity to see the full range of Laura Knight's work across her whole career. For those who are online, the show closes on the 20th of Feb, so please do come along if you can. Otherwise, I want to just make a quick plug for the excellent exhibition catalogue, which is available on our website. Um, with many thanks to the book's contributors, some of whom we're lucky to have presenting today. The show has been a big success, with a large and extremely enthusiastic audience. And I also need to thank the lenders for parting with their artworks, as well as John Croft and the Laura Knight Estate for making this possible. This is our second conference with the Paul Mellon Centre, following a very successful George Stubbs conference in uh, 2019. We'll also be organising another to coincide with our next exhibition of Ingrid Pollard, which opens on the 11th of March. It's Ingrid's first major show, including photography, installation and sculpture. And many thanks to our colleagues at the Mellon Centre and to all of today's contributors. And finally, a bit of quick housekeeping. There's no planned fire alarm test today, so if it does go off, it's real. And there's a fire exit at the top of the auditorium next to the sound desk and also uh, through the doors there. Um, many thanks and enjoy the day. And I'll hand over to Sarah Turner. Hello, everyone. My name's Sarah Turner. I'm the Deputy Director at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. And it's a real pleasure to be with you. So many of you here in the auditorium and also having so many people join us from around the world online. And we hope that you really enjoy today. One of the main purposes of the Paul Mellon Centre as a research institute and an educational charity is to support and share new research on British art and architecture. And one of the main ways we do that is through organising events like this, where we can bring people together to share their research and bring the audience into a conversation about that new work. And it's a real privilege to be able to do that in conjunction with such a landmark exhibition on Laura Knight. And I really want to congratulate the team at the MK Gallery for putting together such a special and significant show, which I think really places Knight at the centre of the history of modern art, not only in Britain, but internationally too. And so I think it is a real landmark and a moment to see an exhibition, not just as the culmination of research, but also a springboard for new thinking. I mean, it's amazing when we see that body of work together from very early in an artist's career, right through into a later period, the kinds of new work it will stimulate and promote. And that's really exciting. So a conference like this is a moment of gathering, a moment of testing the water to hear new ideas, but also to do some future thinking. What other work do we need to do to think about an artist like Knight? to think about the place of women artists in the histories of modernism, to think about the role of institutions like the Royal Academy in shaping artists' careers. So I know we're in for a very fruitful and productive day. Before we go any further, again, I want to thank the MK team, all the technical staff as well for making this happen. As Faye says, you know, organising events in uh, these times is quite complicated, but it's really wonderful that we're able to have people participate both in the room and outside of the room. And we really encourage people who are listening online to be part of that dialogue. We've got Danny in the room on the chat box, so do say hi to her if you're joining us virtually and be part of that conversation. And you'll also be able to ask questions if you're in the virtual audience as well. So we'll flag that up to you when the moment comes. We're going to have a session of three papers next of about 20 minutes each and I'll introduce each of the speakers in turn to you so you get a sense of who they are and what they're going to speak about. Our first speaker is Janet Axton. 
She's a social historian specialising in St Ives and the artists associated with that town. She was awarded a first class honours degree with the Open University and she was a volunteer administrator for uh, the St Ives Tate Action Group, which raised £130,000 towards Tate St Ives, which opened in 1993. And following that, she wrote um, Gasworks the Gallery, the story of Tate St Ives. In 1996, Janet set up a community archive and was its heritage manager, and she gained an MA in Cornish Studies with the University of Exeter in 2004. And so we're going to hear from someone who's a real expert on Cornwall and the intersections of the Cornish landscape um, and uh, Knight's uh, painting and how that informed um, the work that she did. And so Janet's paper is entitled Fast, Smart and Outrageous, Art School Fashion in Laura Knight's Painting. So please join me in giving Janet a very warm welcome to give her paper. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Um, Newlyn in Cornwall is a considerable distance from England's main artistic hub. Its history and its way of life at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries is generally felt to be of major importance only to those of us who live in the area. For the last 30 years or so, local knowledgeable enthusiasts and a few dedicated researchers have been examining in detail specific features of its history, such as artists' houses and their models and the local fishing industry. As a social historian who has lived in St. Ives for more than 35 years, I have recently been examining the lives of the women artists so as to give them a stronger voice. Alongside this, I have been studying the history of women in the textile industry in West Cornwall, a subject which appears to have been consistently ignored. My interest in Dame Laura Knight came about after seeing a version of this exhibition at the Penn Lee Gallery and Museum in Penzance last summer. I began to consider her significance in what is known as the Newlands School. Initially, therefore, I immersed myself in the early part of her autobiography, Oil Paint and Grease Paint. I was fascinated to read that Knight designed and made her own clothes. This prompted me to delve into the subject of dress in her Newland paintings. And I realized that in the few years leading up to the First World War, there was a complete change of style in the clothes her models wore. Here are two examples. The flower appears to be a narrative painting consisting of a posed group of young women wearing clothes that can only be described as late Victorian or Edwardian. The woman on the left is Knight's friend and regular model, London-born Dolly Snell. Now look at this painting, used for the cover of the exhibition catalogue. It could hardly be more different. Two modern young women are in conversation while gazing out to sea. They're wearing woolen sweaters outside their short skirts and have cropped hair. The woman on the right is Phyllis Crocker, another of Knight's regular models, born in Newlyn. Before I go any further, I should like to read from Knight's bio autobiography to demonstrate her early interest and expertise designing and making garments. She wrote, I gave up painting for the time being to make my own clothes. Ethel, Sis and I stitched my wedding dress. Uncle sent 50 pounds as a wedding present and wrote to say that he was coming to give me away. One of his first questions was, what is your wedding dress? I told him I had made it out of one of the linen sheets in Mother's Trousseau. In 1907, Laura and Harold Knight moved to Newlyn, leaving the art colony at Stace, where they had lived intermittently over the previous decade. Twenty years earlier, the far west of Cornwall 
has become the most popular rural region of Britain for painting outdoors. Newlyn was known for being culturally backward, even though it was only two miles from prosperous Penzance, whose regular train service made traveling to and from London straightforward for the many mostly male artists who discovered the appeal of the area, Stanhope Forbes being one of them. Forbes would greatly enhance both his and the little fishing port's reputation. Now, why did Laura and Harold choose Newlyn? Her autobiography is silent on the matter, and I'm putting forward two possible reasons. First, the major exhibition in Nottingham in 1894 showed 234 paintings by 50 different artists based in West Cornwall. These were thought at the time to be at the cutting edge of contemporary art. We know that the 17-year-old Laura Knight visited the Museum and Art Gallery. She apparently thought Nottingham aesthetically a desert for artists and would later write, the most important exhibition I had seen at the castle was one of the Newlyn School, then at the peak of its fame. Second, I believe that the influence of the fine painter Elizabeth Armstrong Forbes was crucial to the future careers of many young women artists. Elizabeth left Canada with her mother in 1873 to attend art school in London. After working in Pont-Avant in Brittany, she arrived in Newlyn at the end of 1885. There she met and later married Stanhope Forbes. Two of her works were hung at the Nottingham Castle show, painted with technical power of a high order, it was reported. Throughout her marriage and the birth of a son, Elizabeth continued to paint and exhibit widely. The end of the first period in Newlyn's history as an art colony is said to have occurred with the opening of the Newlyn Art Gallery in 1895. By then, the little town had entered the modern world, thanks to the construction of two new piers, which greatly expanded the fishing industry. The small town's old-fashioned charms and remoteness, especially beguiling to the early artists, had vanished forever. They moved away or settled in nearby La Morna. The Forbes, however, concerned by this exodus, decided to kick-start a second and more forward-looking art colony by opening a school of painting in 1899. Prospective students had to be able to show that they were competent artists before they could enroll. At least half were women, drawn to the school by the teaching abilities of Elizabeth. The fees were quite high, and it has been said that to be a member of the Forbes Academy was to be a member of a privileged and amusing society. It was impossible for anyone to join the school unless he or she had the necessary amount of money and leisure. In 1904, the School of Painting received some welcome publicity. A well-known expert on art, Gladys Crozier, visited the school for a week. She interviewed the women's students for an article published in the monthly periodical Girls' Realm. Its aims were to be up to date, bright, amusing, and instructive. Gladys Crozier demonstrated what a caring, devoted teacher Elizabeth was and applauded her hands on attitude to her students' well being. The timing of this article was very opportune. Herkimer's Art School, established at Bushy in Hertfordshire in 1883, had just closed. Teaching composition, landscape, and portraiture to both sexes, young women especially were searching for suitable alternative establishments. Elizabeth made certain that her women students had somewhere appropriate to live. Myrtle Cottage, a stylish small Regency-style house, was probably the best known. One young woman staying there was Winifred Frinnewin Tennyson Jesse, who had moved to Newlyn in 1907, the same year as the Knights. 
The 18-year-old Fryn, as she was known, was the great niece of Alfred Lord Tennyson and would become a writer and journalist. Newlin allowed her to embrace the life and all the freedom it brought her with tremendous enthusiasm. During her stay, she wrote an intermittent diary which recorded her first meeting with the knights. Harold and Laura Knight came, she innocent looking in flowery chintz frocks that would never date. Their brilliant painting stunned the whole colony. Laura Knight, in turn, described Fryn and her fellow housemates. The tenants at Myrtle Cottage taught literature. Some wrote tales and poems. Some did woodcuts. Some painted. They dressed in tussle silk, browns, and art colors. It was the center of aesthetic culture. She described the girls as being fast, smart, and outrageous. Nia Lubrin wrote of this period, artists in the early art colonies tended to associate in a generally tight-knit local group, albeit divided along lines of nationality and class, and therefore were essentially urban socialites in a peripheral location. Tragically, Elizabeth Forbes died of cancer in 1912, but her teaching methods and the confidence she gave young women encouraged the next generation of female students to embrace a positive and creative way of living. In her autobiography, Knight wrote of her life in Newlyn. I did the mending and made all my own clothes. A performance of Cranford was given by the Forbes students in which several of my lilac prints took part. Frills covered the wide skirts. The bodices were tight-fitting, a style of my own. Harold often used my frocks for his models. His picture, Reading a Letter, is a good portrait of Phyllis Gotch, another woman artist, who posed in a blue silk taffeta dress of mine. Here are two works by Knight from this period. Wind and Sun was made on the cliffs above Lamorna Cove. It depicts a passive and relaxed way of life, the two, male, the two female figures wearing Edwardian dress. They occupy only the lower section of the painting. Caroline Fox wrote, her models serve as focal points in these works and as color contrasts to the rich blues and blue greens of the sea. Note the scarf on the back of the deck chair. Knight referred to the green feather at length. It was painted over a single day in dreadful weather. One of my most successful evening gowns was made with the help of Susie Chergwin, a local seamstress. This dress was of emerald green, stiff silk. It had a tight laced bodice. The skirt spread at the hem into a great width the grandest dress for a picture. I determined to paint Dolly in it with a short black velvet coat that had been altered for me from a dinner jacket Harold ordered and had never worn. Look carefully. The scarf around Dolly's neck is the same as that hanging over the deck chair in the previous painting. And then Bohemia arrived in Newlyn. In 1902 or three, the painter Gwen John had met Dorothy McNeil, a typist taking classes at the Westminster School of Art. Gwen John's biographer noted that Dorelia, as she was known, enchanted first Gwen and then her brother Augustus. Dorelia was to remain under Augustus's spell and he would paint her over and over for nearly 60 years. Dorelia's influence extended far and wide she was known as the gypsy goddess. For many years, her taste in clothes was followed by students, and apparently all the girls in Chelsea wanted to look like her. Michael Holroyd's biography of Augustus John stated, she ignored the manners and fashions of London and Paris. Her style was peculiar to herself. Her clothes became a uniform adopted by many girls at art colleges and a symbol in their metropolitan surroundings of an unsevered connection with the country. Dorelia wore her hair short. The look caught on, 
and young women felt emancipated when they emulated this cropped fashion. They were known as the Slade crop heads, the Bloomsbury bunnies, or the top knots. In the autumn of 1913, Laura's memoirs recall a stir in Lamorna, where she and Harold were now living. Someone had seen Augustus and Mrs. John driving down the lane. A.J. Munnings invited us to dinner to meet the Johns. John was powerful and broad-shouldered. Mrs. John's looks were startling in their rarity. It was easy to see the inspiration she might be to a painter. Her skin was ivory, her hair black, as she sat that evening with her hands folded um, it, like the Mona Lisa portrait. Her long, tapering white fingers and beautifully kept nails impressed me profoundly. It was impossible to take your eyes off her for long. Her clothes were of her own particular style, and it was she who set the fashion for jumpers and short hair. Michael Holroyd also wrote about this visit. After wonderful dinners, while the others collapsed into exhausted heat, sleep, out John would go in search of Dorelia and do little studies of her in various poses on the rocks. What is particularly fascinating is that years later, when Holroyd was writing the second edition of his book on John, he talked tonight about her memories of the couple. A footnote testifies that she told him, a panel of Dorelia at Falmouth that winter is called the Mauve Jersey. There is no doubt that Dorelia's appearance set a new trend in the colony amongst the young art students and models who now embraced the gypsy look. These would soon appear in Knight's paintings. Pamela Gerish Nunn has written, what gives Knight's depictions of women and girls such vigor is as much the certainty of the protagonists as the energy of their execution. Thoroughly new women, they look long and hard into the depths of the sea, at the horizon or into their own inner mindscapes, unfettered by the Victorian chains of family, respectability and femininity. On the cliffs depicts a young woman wearing her headscarf in exactly the same style as that worn by Dorelia in the previous image. In this charming and informal drawing, the young woman resting with her head on an orange pillow is Phyllis Crocker again. The art historian David Tubby has written, she modeled frequently for night. Her distinctive appearance and dress sense led her to be very popular as a model. Her grandmother and mother had been milliners in Penzance. Phyllis made her own clothes and shoes and dressed distinctively. Finally, we see the model Marjorie Taylor, another local girl, standing perilously close to the edge of the cliff. Although her hair isn't cropped, the way it hangs down in a long plait over her shoulder gives it a casual, modern-day appearance. She might well be looking into the future. Laura Knight said, Cornwall is not like any other sort of country. It's no use trying to compare it with any other place. There are times when you think everything is quite ordinary, and there are times when you feel you are not properly you, but someone else who you don't in the least know. And an atmosphere prevails, which takes away any sense or belief you ever had, and you don't know why, but you aren't in England anymore. I believe that Cornwall ultimately provided Knight with another influence. Thanks to the creativity of the women she encountered after the end of 1913, her paintings reflected a new modernity, bringing her subject matter fully into the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet, for such a rich and stimulating first paper of the day. I'm sure people are already buzzing with questions and thoughts in response to that. 
uh, but save them, we'll, we'll collate them and we'll have a panel discussion after all the three papers. We're going to move on to our second paper now, and that's by Linda M. Bassett, who's a third year PhD student in the History of Art Department at the University of Bristol and a member of the doctoral college there. Her thesis, Laura Knight, Beyond the Body, focuses on the artist's representations of women between 1911 and 1930 and examines Knight's encounters with female subjects in marginal areas. So I think there'll be lots of interesting intersections with what Janet's just said. She collaborated with the MK Gallery for this exhibition um, and her wider research interests include British art of the early 20th century, women as models and makers of art, representations of the female body and gendered visual culture. So please join me in welcoming Linda to give her paper. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. This presentation addresses Knight's use of the dressmaker, a motif which occurs frequently in her balletic work and which is essential in delivering her broader visual narrative. The four works I examine were produced within a period of approximately seven years and collectively suggest the significance of this figure. The exchange between the female subjects which they facilitate underpins Knight's visual agenda at this time. At first, she was drawn to the visual contrasts, in her own words, between the artificial brilliance of the dancers' costumes and the plain clothes of their dresses. But it is the interaction between these figures which provides the insight into her visual schema, one which highlights female presence and visibility, both within the domain of performance, but also within the social and cultural territories beyond. In her study of the Ballet Russe, Lynn Garofola explains how the world of ballet was in fact a site of masculine control, and in light of this, I propose that Knight's works provide an alternative visual record, one which asserts female presence in an otherwise male-centric environment. Closer study of the original versions of two of these works support this view. The Ballet Girl and the Dressmaker was a commission by the American industrialist H. Earl Hoover. He had seen a recent work by Knight which featured the dancer Barbara Bonner and secured a new work using the same model. The original study for this new commission is highly finished with great attention to detail. No doubt it would have required minimal alteration to be worked into a finished painting such as the quality of the piece. However, in the finished work, Knight added the figure of her own dressmaker, offering no rationale other than her hands and type were perfect. But her presence adds a subtly nuanced dimension to the work, which is crucial to its broader narrative. The addition of this second figure reinforces this as a decidedly feminine space in both visual and physical terms. The figures complement each other, lending a visual harmony to the scene. The dancer, muscular and powerful, has real solidity. Similarly, the dressmaker is produced in heavily saturated dark tones, which cement her equal physical presence within the composition. The pensive expressions of both women convey their concentration, implying that they are more than simply bodies and capable of autonomous thought. This results in an uncompromising declaration of female presence, which also reveals Knight's recognition of both women on equal terms. Similarly, preparing for her entrance is an intimate and refined study of the female figure. However, its original version, Motley, cut down and repainted after it failed to sell, depicted a company of male performers with the two female figures placed in their midst. The revised composition, however, uh, 
forgive me, lost my place temporarily. The revised composition, however, abounds with female presence. The remaining male figures are relegated to less prominent positions which trail off into the background, illuminated by the light from the stage which connects them with the public space of performance and its male-centric connotations. This newly constructed space behind the curtain now falls under female command, the amended title asserting female presence with use of the feminine possessive pronoun. The dancer now fills the lower half of the composition, her form comprising of a series of ovals which extend from her skirt. These are mirrored in the placement of her arms and in the garlands which link her body with her costume. The costume also provides the visual connection between the ballerina and the dressmaker. Its oval shapes echoed in the rounded face, shoulders and hair of the latter. The repetition of these circular forms infers that the female presence depicted here is complete in its unity, whole and unbroken. The dress itself, a potent emblem of femininity, becomes a symbol which unites the figures on a professional level, the dancer who wears it and the dressmaker who has created it. Thus, both figures are bound together within the composition and the parity of their professional competence is inferred. This is best conveyed in the expressions of the women, both concentrating on their respective tasks. These paintings represent two different elements of female creativity, but Knight's uniform treatment of both figure types may be read as an indication of their shared talent and professionalism. With the ballet girl and the dressmaker, Knight refers to the challenge of arranging two equally important figures together, yet she successfully conveys both with equal detail, especially obvious in their hands, faces and garments. She adopts the same approach in preparing for her entrance, where her treatment of both figures is again consistent. This stylistic choice blurs the social and cultural distinctions associated with the manual skill of the dressmaker and the creative talent of the professional artiste. In both works, the dressmaker exists on a par with the ballerina, which highlights the broader debate concerning the definitions of art and craft and the hierarchical classifications which historically had defined the artiste from the artisan. Knight had experimented with the motif of the dressmaker in earlier prints. Here, the graphic tonal quality emphasizes the contrast between the clothed and partially undressed figures. Yet in spite of the display of female flesh, there is no hint of voyeurism, and the role of the dressmaker is essential to this innocuous reading of the female body. Dressing room number one shows a ballerina reclined in a relaxed pose, which indicates the absence of physical tension in the private space of the dressing room. Her upper body, revealed in a partially naked state, resonates with this intimacy. Her pose strikes a visual chord with some more familiar classical nudes that uphold the traditions of male looking and the assumed availability of the female body. Knight, however, provides no visual access to the front of the body, or more specifically, the breasts. The sexualized contexts of looking are removed, and the only looking that can occur is non-threatening. In fact, it is the semi-naked figure herself who is the only one actively looking within the composition. And even then, her own gaze towards the dressmaker is not returned. By gazing downwards, the dressmaker firmly rejects the only opportunity for visual connection with the semi-naked female. And this is the crucial point of this work. If the dressmaker were not present, then this sophisticated system of looking would simply not be possible, and the visual and narrative content of the composition would become incoherent. 
The accustomed symbols of femininity, the various dresses conspicuous around the dressing room, are established here as inadequate, usurped instead by the exchange which occurs between the women. In this space, the female figures control the systems of looking, or rather, not looking, at the female body. Dressing for the ballet addresses similar problems associated with the display and interpretation of the female form, and is another example of the relaxed intimacy of women in the company of other women. Once more, this encounter is conveyed as natural and devoid of sexualized looking. The dancer sits before the mirror, but where we would expect to see her breasts fully revealed in its reflection, we see instead her dressmaker, whose role here is vital in preventing any form of visual and potentially sexualized encounter taking place. The contrasting figures also reference the inevitability of the aging process, a reminder perhaps that superficial beauty is transient and that sexualized looking and desire is most easily achieved with the representation of a young, fertile body. Considered together, these works assert positive female presence and interrogate the exchanges between women in a space where they are represented both intimately and as professionals. They suggest female control of these rarely seen spaces of performance and are devoid of any improper connotation derived from active looking. Crucially, it is Knight's figures that control both the systems of looking and the visual access to their own bodies. The role of the dressmaker is essential in ensuring the success of this particular strategy. The dressmakers also present an alternative perspective of women involved with the clothing and textiles industries. During the 1840s, an extensive cultural discourse emerged which painted an unsavory picture of the sempstress that questioned her social and moral vulnerability. Although Knight's images were produced some 70 years later, concerns regarding the propriety of working women still remained, and the early 20th century echoed the belief that, women were, that working women threatened domestic femininity and disrupted social order. Knight's dressmakers, however, provide a 20th century model of femininity which reflected the social milieu of its time. During the 1890s, the arts and crafts movement had raised the profile of hand embroidery and related trades. This coincided with the emergence of the women's suffrage movement, which advocated wider educational and professional opportunities for women. This perhaps accounts for the modern financially independent professionals that we encounter in Knight's dressmakers. The central issue is that historically judgments had been made about the physical, moral and social status of women based purely on representations of their body and the dominant modes of looking were a product of male-centric cultural and institutional discourse. Knight's works challenge these outmoded, speculative ideologies, providing visual statements which comment on women's positions in both professional and wider social contexts. Knight's dressmakers form part of a visual exchange which assert the female figure as something other than the object of male attention, and their presence facilitates an alternative method of viewing the female body which undermines established art historical modes of looking. They are therefore key figures who offer an alternative perspective of female presence. And whilst the selected works examine these issues within the context of performance, their central themes resonate in a much wider sense beyond. Knight's visual language asserts female presence both visually and symbolically whilst also highlighting professional independence, qualities which resonated with the aspirations of the 20th century woman, and indeed, Knight herself. Knight's dressmakers allow us to consider the social and cultural implications of how women are viewed. 
These are issues which remain as significant today as when the works were produced. Evidence that display and interpretation of the female body is a show, or in this particular context, a so, which simply must endure. Thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. It's great to have that really close looking and that you were guiding us through those pictures with you um, as you were talking about them. I really enjoyed getting into the detail of, of Knight's uh, work. So we have our third paper in this panel and it will be given by Ella Nixon. Ella is a doctoral researcher at Northumbria University. I promised you really new research. This is all hot off the press or it hasn't you know, even arrived at the press in many cases. Her project is a Northern Bridge funded collaborative doctoral award, which uses the Lang Art Gallery in Newcastle upon Tyne to explore the representation of female artists within regional art galleries. Her research looks at wider feminist art history in relationship to museological um, concerns from the second half of the 20th century to the present day. And she's been involved in various curatorial and educational projects, including the recent Challenging Convention exhibition um, of last year at the Lang, and frequently writes about art on various platforms. And so I want to ask you to welcome Ella with me for our third paper of this panel. Okay, hello everybody. I want to begin by taking you through a tour of the Lang Art Gallery to begin. The Lang Art Gallery is situated in Newcastle upon Tyne. You might have seen some of the paintings in the exhibition from the gallery, which are very familiar to me. Now we're walking through the marble hall, the beautiful high ceilings, and we can come go up the stairs and look down and we can see Henry Moore. We can now go through the gallery and we go into a um, another room and we come across this exhibit, the Circus Dinner Service. You might have seen this in the exhibition. I just saw it there and I loved seeing it again. You can see the beautiful illustrations and colours. If you see this piece and you thought in the whole gallery this was your favourite, you would think the same as Paula Rigo when she visited the gallery in 1992. She, after her visit, wrote to the Keeper of Art, saying, the Laying Art Gallery, home of such beautiful Victorian pictures and a masterpiece of a dinner service by Dame Laura Knight. Bracket, I really loved this. This quote, I think, helps me to emphasize the personal connections that many people see in the Laying with Laura Knight and the importance of her work there. So my presentation is about Laura Knight and the Regional Art Gallery. As I said, I will use um, the Lang Art Gallery as a case study for this, but this raises wider questions about other regional galleries as well. So firstly, I'm going to draw upon this personal connection through the collection itself, itself and what that can say about Laura Knight. Just a brief bit of history. The Lang Art Gallery was founded in 1901 without a collection. It was completely empty. And then in 1904, it opened. The Link is a regional gallery, so that's, I'm trying to build this understanding as those funded and administered by local government, and that's Angela Summerfield's definition. And that's really important because when we think about funding, we need to consider the type of public. This is the public of Newcastle who have a relationship with this gallery, and that's how they can justify these exhibitions and acquisitions of works. The Laying had one curator for 50 years when it first opened, and he was called Collingwood Bernard Stevenson. Now, this is really important to understanding Laura Knight's place within the gallery, because Collingwood Bernard Stevenson had a personal connection to Knight. They had both studied at the Nottingham School of Art, and there are examples of correspondences between the curator and the Knights. We can see here a letter 
um, from, from the curator to Harold, and they're discussing Laura's upcoming watercolour exhibition at the gallery. Um, this is built on the work of Leia Angui Vilches, who was a PhD student at Northumbria who just graduated, and she looked at these letters and built up this idea of this personal connection, which has become important within, within my own research. Within the paper, the regional papers, the local ones, the public understood this relationship too. It was reported, Laura Knight is a very old friend of the curator, and he told me today that he remembered an exhibition of her work when he was in Nottingham and she lived near him. So this was in the Newcastle Evening Chronicle. So this was a dialogue with the public that was understood with the artist. And over at his, during his time in the laying and also slightly after his time, a collection of Laura's works were built up. We can see here the three oil paintings within the collection. I think you'll probably recognize the, the beach and a dark pool from, from the exhibition. Um, and these were bought through this relationship with Collingwood Bernard Stevenson. This was a connection that really built up the laying with the artist. So we can see for the beach, it was bought upon the creator's suggestion. And also for the fair, it was a direct purchase from the studio. So we've got two key, key moments of agency there and personal connection with the curator. Also, Laura Knight's identity has become so embedded within the history of the Lang Art Gallery that we can see a copy of the beach on the outside wall of the gallery in the middle. So Laura is an artist which is associated with this gallery. And this is kind of throws up questions about how we can curate Laura Knight within the regional art gallery and how that can be different to, re to national galleries. And my own thesis has been building up this idea of collecting communities. So the idea that galleries have have built up collections based on local and personal connections. And this is a way to add more of a personal voice into curating certain artists. This is built upon the historian Simon Schretter's theory of communication communities, which is used in a different context. But this is the idea that you can consider factors such as age, class, and gender in shaping behavioral norms and identities. If we take that to a, like a museological setting, this is how we can consider how certain galleries build up their collections based on the public, so the public that the, the gallery considers as more of a dialogue. If we're going to use an example of this for Laura Knight's work, we can see again the circus dinner service. And this is actually um, an exhibit at uh, part of the Manchester Art Gallery collection. And this service came to the gallery specifically through the collection of Gracie Fields, a local performer who was in Rochdale, which is just 10 miles away from Manchester. Well, although it wasn't donated from her collection, it was just in its provenance, it was from there. This was art fund purchased. This shows a really local connection that brings a whole new story to, to the ex exhibit. And I noticed as well when I was going through the galleries, I, I saw this name um, and smiled. Now, I want to move on to how this has influenced curation, or maybe how it sits in relation to curation. Since Collingwood Bernard Stevenson left the gallery in the mid 20th century, um, Laura Knight has been created in various ways across in the Lang and of course in other regional galleries. One of the most common ways that she's been created has been as a major artist. So for example, in the New Art for a New Era exhibition in 2006 at the, the Lang, we can see the most outstanding oil paintings in the Lang collection, major British artists are represented. And Laura Knight was one of these. Also, for real life 20th century watercolours, we see, again, major artists such as, again, Laura Knight. Notice how she's distinguished from local painters here. So it's quite important we have these two different identities and how the, the Newcastle public can kind of think about Laura in relation to local artists. The idea that she has been related to local artists as well has occurred at a national level. So her name has been used to enhance the status of other artists in the national press. Um, L Louisa Hodgson is an artist from Newcastle and it was reported in the Daily Mirror 
Miss Hodgson told me on varnishing day, just after Dame Laura Knight had been praising her picture, that, he, that she had been painting ever since childhood. Notice that, day, that Laura Knight's name is here dropped to kind of enhance the status of Louisa Hodgson. So this is a way that on a national level, um, she has been understood. Another frequent way that she's been created in galleries has been as the woman artist. And this relates a lot to my, my thesis. This idea of the woman artist identity really began to emerge on a popular level, popular level from the 1970s with feminist art history. Some of you might recognize the essay, the, um, the essay title on the side of the board, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists by Linda Notklim. Um, and this, is, this term, the woman artist, has been written about lots and lots ever since. This has been, I've been thinking about in terms of more of a globalized trope and term, a common way that she's been created across many, many galleries and a frequent method, frequent method of understanding her work. This has led to exhibitions, oh, this, in terms of um, how regional galleries can understand this, is influence how the laying has communicated, how they collect their works. So for example, for the bottom quote, it says, Tyne and Ware museums have been trying to build up its collection of women's and 20th century art for some years. So this label is used to actually talk about the collection and build up priorities. And this approach has extended to other female artists as well, such as when the work by Gillian Ayres, Papua, which I absolutely love, I think it's amazing, and you should definitely see it if you visit the Lang. Um, when that was purchased from the gallery, the newspaper, the um, Newcastle Journal, published it with a title, Gallery to Buy Woman's Work. Notice how her name is not referred to. It's just a woman's work. And this has also led to other exhibitions. And by the way, this is not me judging which is good or which is bad, but this is just raises questions about the many different ways she's created. Um, in Hanley, an exhibition called A Feminine Eye in 1992, a celebration of the work of women represented. And that's including Laura Knight and Dodd Proctor, who of course worked with friends together. Just to outline the term strategic essentialism as well, this is when we take an identity and we use the identity to build up a, like an exhibition or a group around them. So to try and increase the representation of a certain group. Another example of this would be from Victorian to modern innovation and tradition in the work of Vanessa Bell, Gwen John and Laura Knight. This exhibition, um, so again, here we have described three important female artists. So we see this as a big point that is emphasized that they are three female artists. Most recently at the Lang, um, the exhibition that I have been involved with, or challenging convention, grouped Laura Knight with Dodd Proctor, Gwen John and Vanessa Bell. Um, and here we can see a newspaper article title, Lang Art Gallery to reopen with exhibition, celebrating four remarkable women artists. So we see this term again and again crop up, and this influences how the public can understand how Laura Knight is created. Underneath the title as well, you'll see um, a female focus. So again, it's this emphasis on a certain identity. This is a really interesting thing, I think, especially to consider when there's many quotes about how Laura spoke about her own identity as a woman, um, and that was something I really saw as well in the exhibition. Um, Rosie Broadley wrote, she was keen to avoid categorization as a woman artist and credited her own success to sheer hard work. So it's really difficult to, to think about how to create Laura Knight. And as I said, this isn't a judgment because I think both can be done extremely, extremely well, but it's a question that needs to be addressed and explored. So I'm going to try I'm going to finish off this this paper by taking us back to the Lang Art Gallery and now we're going to walk into the challenging convention exhibition. This was a very very successful exhibition. Um, lots of visitors and lots and lots of positive feedback. The opening wall has an introductory text and the the approach that the curator Lizzie Jacklin took was to use context at the start 
the like kind of political um, education available to to women artists at the time to bring them all together and you can see the four four works just hidden behind that that figure there by by each artist and then as you walk through the exhibition space there was a space dedicated to each artist which focused on them as an individual so it was like four individual individual exhibitions within one and when we get to the end of this exhibition we can see the circus dinner set, set. again in a different in a different way it's created um, so hopefully I've taken you on a journey of all these different methods of curating and I think it raises some really important questions. Just a few conclusions. Um, I really wanted to kind of emphasise this idea of a personal connection and networks embedded within regional art galleries and the potential of them to, to bring new interpretations. I know at the Challenging Convention exhibition they, we exhibited the letter um, from the curator the one that I showed earlier on to Harold Knight, and that brings a different type of voice. Um, she's frequently created as this major artist or a woman artist. So again, those are different methods that we can bear in mind. Okay, thank you everybody. As we get settled, start thinking of your questions and ideas. Do you want some water? There we go. Do you want to? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for three really fantastic papers. So it's always such a privilege to hear new thinking and how people are reshaping, re-examining, um, confronting anew um, a work um, of an artist with uh, Light Knight, who has such a long uh, career. And I think for me, what was really interesting about hearing these papers together was I think you all provided us with different sites or spaces through which to rethink Knight's career. So Janet, for me, you took us to Cornwall and you, know, you provided us there. We were sort of stood with Knight on those cliff edges, contemplating um, that landscape and the importance of um, formation in an artist's career, training, the people that influence you, um, those, especially in that very crucial uh, moment in, a, in an early career where it's in formation. So I think that was um, really fascinating to see kind of the role of a space, an actual place and the landscape in conversation with the paintings that you um, showed on the screen. And then Linda, for you took us into those, the sort of the backstage rooms as well, those sites of performance, but they're always sort of off stage slightly, aren't they? I mean, I know there are some which are on stage, but a lot of that sort of behind the scenes, the sort of space of um, sweat and tears mm -hmm. and, you know, the grittiness of um, performance and painting. I think that was that sort of those spaces where um, I love your phrase where Knight created this alternative visual record, the spaces of sewing and putting together um, a performance. So that was this other site where she's, I think, in all these works, interrogating modern life and what it is to be a modern subject and a, a modern artist. And then Ella, you took us into a very different space, and that's really interesting in relationship to seeing an exhibition downstairs and being in a museum, to think about the role of an institution in shaping the reputation of an artist, either during their lifetime and all those personal networks. And again, it's a bit backstage, isn't it? What goes on behind the scenes to get a work into a collection? Mm. You know, your connections with a curator, the kind of strategies of a, an art gallery, building a collection. And I think that institutional space and then thinking about how exhibitions position and then reposition an artist, that work is constantly ongoing. So lots of food for thought. But I just thought just to get us uh, going, and we've got some really good time for questions and discussions. And uh, again, a call out to our online audience um, to please submit your questions via the Q&A. And uh, we've got someone here in the audience who will, uh, Alice will uh, speak, speak them aloud for us as well. But I just thought to get us going, I, uh, it's quite a big question, but why do each of you think it's important to look at night now? in 2022 i mean what what 
what, why does it, you know, the sort of so what question, why does it matter that we look at her work and sort of, in a way, what's, what's new, what's left to do in, in, in that work? So, Ella, maybe I'm going to, because you've yeah, spoken yeah. last, I'm going to just open that out and, you know, as a PhD student as well, that's kind of an interesting proposition. So, could you, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so, um, I think... What, what really strikes me about, about Knight is that she's got so many different mediums that she works in. And I think especially with my, with my thesis, I, I see how galleries are becoming ever more exper experimental with how they're exhibiting different mediums. And she seems as this kind of, you know, one of the, like such a strong, strong influence in the 20th century and kind of spanning across many of these different mediums. So I just think she has, she's a very inspirational figure um, and I think many people can take from her kind of her determination to to work across all these mediums. Um, yeah, yeah. I think she absolutely had to work hard, didn't she, to negotiate yeah. all these different persona and institutions like the Royal Academy to kind of build up markets as well. I think we have to take ourselves back to you know what it was like to form a career as a, a woman artist in that yeah. uh, you know in that moment in the late nineteenth century early 20th century and the barriers to to training as well to being able to study the nude and I think again we just have to do a little bit of that sort of historical reflection so thank yeah you. Janet what about for you the why is this important well I think what fascinates me so much is how much more we're taking seriously the work of women artists and we're getting away from um, how they painted to much more about them as themselves and the people that they interacted with. Um, I was particularly interested in your, with those dressmakers there, that they are people. And up to now, we ignore so many people. And one of the things I wanted to show was those models, they had names, dressmakers, they have names. And we're beginning to realize that women are important and they should be named. And this is a wonderful opportunity to um, present this and to, it's a good example of being able to actually do that because as far as I'm concerned, the fact that she wrote that autobiography was fantastic because when you actually hear somebody's own words and there are plenty of artists who don't write like that, it, it just opened things up and made you look at her life and her work and the people that she was with so much better and I think that's what we should be doing when we're looking at artists, especially women artists. So wrapping them back within that social context yes. and those, those cultural networks yes. um, that you talked about as well. Thank you. Aminda, for you. Well, for me, I think Laura Knight is without doubt one of the most significant, one of the most prolific artists that this country has ever produced. Let's just forget the, the sex element for a moment. I mean, male or female, in terms of the span of her career, the diversity of the work, the subjects. And what amazed me, when I stumbled across Laura Knight by chance, um, I fully expected to find loads of material on Laura Knight that there would be plenty to hand. And so many people are not even familiar with her name. And it seems to me, you know, that when she was alive, she was something of a celebrity. Mm. Um, but sadly, since her death, she's sort of fallen into this bracket of neglected women artists. And now, frankly, I mean, for those who are familiar with the name, it's so easy to dismiss it and say, mm, well, yeah, Laura Knight, but you know, she was a figurative painter. Mm. Well, arguably, okay, there are figurative elements of the work, but the underlying message is, and you can trace this through all the phases of a career, that the detail is in the looking and it says so much more, which sort of resonates with British society at that time and how uh, women in particular, from my point of view, were responding to changes in society. And that's something that is as current today as it was when Laura Knight was active. Yeah, and it's really great seeing the exhibition, isn't it? Because, 
you know, when you see the scope of the work, you know, that, like you say, that easy pigeonholing, like, oh, she's a figurative artist, she's been, because of her association with the RA, she's an academic artist, you know, these kind of labels that get pinned on artists. Then you go and, see, and you see things like, oh, she's working in ceramics, you know, there's those amazing kind of drawings and print work, she's, you know, depicting industry, and, you know, it's actually quite hard to come up with one label that can, you know, adequately and, and uh, you know, capture that, exactly. that work in its full range. So well, thank you so much. That's opened up even more. Um, I think we had, uh, we've got a question from one of our online uh, members of the audience. So we're going to hear uh, from, from them. So thank you so much for submitting that. Hello. Um, so we have some wonderful questions from the online audience. So let's look at, so we've got one question for Linda. So um, Deborah says, I would be very interested to hear your thoughts regarding the gaze and self-portrait with nude. And another similar question, um, how is Laura Knight's gaze in the news different to more conventional male gaze, as you described in the dressing room? Uh, firstly, um, the first part of that question, specifically relating to uh, portrait with nude. Um, that is a uh, that is really that together with Daughters of the Sun, the two works produced within a two year period of each other, uh, and those works together, that is really the sort of seminal point in Knight's career. It's at that point where she really sort of gets to grip with gets to grips with the female figure, and the potential that she has using that as a specific subject, and from that moment onwards the focus on the female figure is much more intense so I, I do touch on that in some unpublished work um, and I explore her use of uh, space between herself as the, the artist and the naked model and that establishes some important connections which challenge uh, the sort of institutional modes of looking and modes of representation uh, sorry, the second part of the question, if you could just refresh me. How is Laura Knight's gaze in the news different to the more conventional male gaze, as you described in the dressing rooms? Okay, so Laura, Knight's, Laura Knight offers an alternative perspective. This is my interpretation of, of her work anyway. Um, so she sets up these very complicated systems of looking, which confront challenge and provide an alternative to the sort of established sort of hierarchical stages of looking which invariably tend to be male centric and which are male dominated now i suppose i would i would classify laura knight as a feminist with a small f i mean she certainly wasn't waving banners and and making big uh, sort of speeches declaring all of this but it's all there in her work. Um, I mean, I, I suspect that she was probably conscious of safeguarding her own position and her own acceptance within the sort of institutional hierarchy. Um, so she does everything in a very understated way, but she is challenging conventions. And that's something that you can see in, in all the phases of her work. I thought it was interesting as well how you, um, you know, in your visual analysis, that the way you took us on a tour of, you know, that, that gaze, the sort of front on central gaze is sort of refuted and it's these sort of angles between looking down, looking, you know, there's sort of these interesting sort of obliques mm. that she creates visually through the composition, which was great. Again, we'll go, we can go in and see in person um, downstairs. There was a question here, a gentleman had he waved at me uh, to start with, so I can take one there, and then I can see this lady, and then another question there. So we've, it's great, we've got lots. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely fascinating three different papers, and very well put together, all of the papers, and very well put together as a program, because it gave us a real insight into her work. My question is for Ella. Um, I, I must confess I haven't been to the Lang Art Gallery and I now know I should, so, you know, forgive me. <laughs> but I wondered if, if you'd looked also at how the Lang's collecting programme was similar to that at other galleries around the country of a similar time. I was thinking of the Ferrans or the uh, Royal Albert in Exeter or the one in Plymouth as well, all of which were attempting to establish civic pride, if you like. Um, and therefore, Laura Knight's work must have been part of that. Have you looked at the Lang in that context as well? 
Um, yeah, so I, ha I have looked, like my, my research is kind of more from the 1970s, so I have looked at it like in more, you know, earlier stages. And there are real like kind of similarities, especially in terms of collecting based on getting some kind of survey of, of English arts. And it's really interesting as well for all these regional galleries because they're not trying to build up like an international collection unlike the National Gallery, but they're wanting to build up a national collection, which is more of like a survey. And a lot of this is like gap filling frequently comes into like the, the collecting policies. Um, so this idea that they must have like a, a, a constable, like, you know, that kind of that kind of method. So I think this is, is quite difficult, like for its early history in terms of collecting women artists who weren't seen as in this like canon that they needed to collect and fill in the gaps. So that kind of, that strategy came came much later. There's a question. Yes, the, the mic doesn't have to travel too far. Yes, um, my question, I suppose, our comment is about the three of you looking into the whys she needing to be seen as a modern, part of a modern artist. Because um, one thing that's not been mentioned about her is her class. And she was, she had a troubled upbringing, loss and poverty. And she was essentially a working class young woman as she was growing up. And um, the link with the, um, your link, um, Laura, I think with um, the, um, sorry, I've just lost my train. Uh, with the, the seamstress and the ballerina, her focus that would be natural to her because she saw working people as the norm. She worked from being very young. She taught too young, didn't she? Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's an, it's not just that she was a figurative artist at some point that she was seen as not very important, but that she was a popular artist. And I think the um, establishment at that time, who were uh, bringing in the modern, you know, the Bloomsbury set and all those associates, Roger Fry, modernism was r essentially a, um, a very upper class sort of um, mm -hmm. movement, if you like, uh, from where I'm coming, as it was brought into the UK. And so I think that's another reason. I'm just wondering what you think about her being in the modern, but not being seen that as the time. Or why, her, why she continued to be just a popular artist. I, I mean, I think I can uh, attempt to provide you with some kind of answer. As you say, Laura Knight's working class background was something that I think she never really strayed too far from. Um, and throughout her life, even when her and Harold were sort of fairly uh, sort of comfortable, uh, they were always very conscious of where the next sort of lot of money was coming from, you know. And, and even when they're sort of in their 40s and in London, she recalls how, you know, she's been away on a painting trip and comes back to find that Harold has had to sell the entire house full of furniture to pay off outstanding bills. Um, so that, that element of, of working class was very important to her and remains so. And in that sense, she is able to engage with real life, I will phrase it, as she sees it. So her work, I think, documents real slices of life uh, through the early part of, and, and up to the sort of midway through the 20th century. Now, one of the criticisms from an academic point of view is that, um, as you say, in relation to other artists of the period who were experimenting with more modernist, in inverted commas, techniques, Laura Knight stayed faithful to this kind of figurative representational element. And from an academic perspective, she's criticized for not being experimental enough. I mean, the way that I approach her work is that she may not be, she does experiment with various styles. I mean, I think this fantastic exhibition allows you to see that and how she moves through phases of her career and is, is still experimenting stylistically with, with paint and print and so on and so forth. Um, but she's criticized for not being experimental enough and that that to uh, sort of rigid academics 
means in some senses that her work lacks this sort of intellectual integrity. My approach is that whilst her stylistic approach may not be experimental, she is engaging with uh, the sort of significant elements of 20th century life. The details are there, but that's the key thing about Laura Knight. Everything is, it's almost encoded into the detail of those works and you need to look so hard and then you spot something and it, it, it sends you on a sort of a, um, a sort of a contextual journey of life at that time. Uh, like for instance, this sort of snobbery around um, uh, sort of skill, you know, of the sort of seamstress with the manual skill uh, which, you know, from sort of the mid-19th century onwards was, was a sign of their social and moral degradation, um, which is absolute nonsense. <laughs> so I hope that sort of answers the question. I, I do tend to go around the houses a little bit. My apologies <laughs> It's good for to, that. you know, see the workings of your mind. This is, you know, this is the, it's, what a conference is for. But I think as well, it's, it's such an interesting question, and I, I think it helps us um, rethink the the space of the royal academy um, as well for especially for women artists who mm -hmm. again we have to remember like getting a, an art dealer someone to sell your work at this stage you know the commercial gallery scene was was it was nothing like it is today you know there, was, there were very few small numbers of galleries who dealt with certain artists and they were mainly male artists mm -hmm. and so for Knight and Dodd Proctor um, like Gertrude Hermes the contemporaries. The Royal Academy is so important because the summer exhibition, massive public, allows them to sell their work. And like you say, they needed mm. to sell their work. Mm. They're not, you know, they don't have a big, you know, bank balance and, mm. you know, parents who are funding their careers. So this, sh the, you know, Hermes calls it the biggest shop window in the world. Mm. And it allows them to interact with a public of thousands on an annual basis and sell you know, develop a market. And mm. I think that's really interesting as well. Like how, like you're saying, how do these artists live? <laughs> you know, and I, I think that sort of interaction between the kind of social class, commercial life, artistic subjects, well, you know, it's a really rich and quite complex picture. Mm. So. May, may I say something um, on this? Because I think that's very interesting. But I'd like to take it much earlier because about her working class background. And I'd, I, It'd be very interesting to know much more, and we, nobody's talking about this, her time in Stace and the people that she um, worked amongst, and that was a very remote place. It was interesting coming to uh, Newlyn because clearly, um, as I explained, uh, um, women who went to the School of Painting generally had money. You know, you couldn't afford to, the, the fees were quite high. Um, and yet she was in a local community and obviously interacted with that community, which were, mo were working class as well. And when I heard when she talked about Susie Chergwin had um, helped make that dress, uh, that was amazing because it, was, it would be something that she would do because she made her own clothes, but she was prepared to um, share and have help from other specialists. So I think the whole subject in her early life um, about the class, I think is really worth pursuing um, in greater detail. Yeah, really fascinating. We'll take another online question. Uh, so will you just take your mask, just because I think it might be a bit difficult just to hear. So that, that's great, thank you. And then we've got some more in-house in questions as well. I will, I will allow that, yeah, if we can just make, get a mic so everyone can hear um, online as well. Hi, three excellent papers, thank you very much indeed. Um, it was Linda's uh, putting together those four images. I've been intrigued for a while at the thought that, um, would it be anachronistic to talk about a female gaze in the 1920s? You mentioned Knight's feminism, you mentioned the male gaze, you didn't actually use the term the female gaze. Can she be said to be aware of the fact that women have a different view of the world to men and be articulating that in these pictures? I think the, the simple answer is yes. I think Laura Knight was aware. Um, one of the things that strikes me about Laura Knight, and it, it's one of the, the things that sort of 
it, it's enormously frustrating for me uh, the fact that Laura Knight is so incredibly guarded and understated in everything that she does uh, because she is always conscious of protecting herself within a working and commercial environment and within the sort of institutional context as well. So she doesn't want to tread on too many toes. And so when she addresses things like, for instance, you know, the, the sort of basic premise of my presentation is that she's setting up a system of looking that challenges the existing modes of looking which are, are male-based. Um, she offers a, an alternative uh, that gives us something else to think about, but she never actually says, right, I'm going to paint a series of paintings and they're going to challenge the male gaze and, and this is what these works are about. Laura Knight will just say quite simply, I was fascinated with life backstage and I wanted to capture the sort of hard work behind the performance. But as I say, I mean, this is only my, my personal take on it. I think that when you look at the works in detail, they set up systems of looking, which, I mean, Laura Knight was aware of. She's constructing, you know, what we're looking at. But I think if you had asked her, she probably would have been reluctant to commit to saying, yes, that's exactly what I was trying to do, if that answers your question. Okay. I, I would like to think I'm not a feminist. In, in fact, I'm, I'm fiercely proud of the fact that I say this thesis is not a feminist piece of work. It is not a feminist doctrine. And I think the danger is it can be almost... Um, it sort of sits between two poles, if you like. If you've got a woman artist who is concentrating on the female subject, the automatic correlation is going to be that, oh, she's a feminist. If these paintings were being painted by a man, I think the message would be exactly the same. I would look at these paintings and say, there's a system of looking there between the women. So I think sometimes we need to forget that Laura Knight is a woman and just appreciate what is happening within the works. And I, I have this kind of problem with male artists, female artists, and how, as a sort of culture, we're conditioned to make that differentiation. I think they should just be artists. The fact that they're men or they're women or they're gender, gender fluid or whatever the case may be, that shouldn't come into it. We should just be able to appreciate the works as works, regardless of, of who they're by. But that's another debate. We're getting into the, the, the real kind of, you know, rub of the issue. Why, you know, again, why it's important to have these discussions about where you place women artists, how they've been, uh, how history, you know, the work that art historians of the future will do will be very different as well as our discussions around gender, you know, are constantly evolving. So it's exciting. It feels like this is, you know, an evolving conversation as well. And um, we've got some online uh, questions, so we'll make sure our online audience are represented as well. So let's, let's hear one of those questions. Uh, this is a question for Ella. So the Lang in 2013 had an exhibition of Laura Knight's work. Might Ella like to comment on any differences between the curation of that exhibition with the curation of the excellent, challenging exhibition? Yeah. I mean, I do have hearing aids in there. I find it really hard. Yeah. Can we turn that mic up a little bit? Would you, can you repeat that? Just to make sure. Can everyone at the back hear? So maybe I'm just go. Um. That's better, I That's think, it, yeah. yeah. I've lost my place now, hang on. <laughs> uh, so the Lang in 2013 had an exhibition of Laura Knight's work. Might Ella like to comment on any differences between the curation of that exhibition with the curation of the challenging exhibition? Yeah. Um, so does, I, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, okay. it does. <laughs> Can you just, for people who might not have seen those exhibitions, will you just give us a, a synopsis? Yeah. Or? Um, so in 2013, the Link had um, Laura Knight portraits exhibition. Um, I think I saw the catalogue for it actually in the in the exhibition downstairs, um, and I and also the, for the challenging exhibition. I think it's the challenging convention exhibition um, of like 
yeah, last year. I don't know, I have to admit, like I don't know um, much about the portraits exhibition yet, because I'm yet to, to kind of like find out more about that. But I know that it was done with Plymouth Art Gallery. So it was like jointly curated and that just focused on the works of Laura Knight. Um, and I read the catalogue and it's all very, I think it was Rosie Broadley, the creator. Um, and I know that she made some comments about Laura Knight as a, as a woman artist. And so that was a, a slight angle for it. And I suppose we can kind of compare that to the Challenging Convention exhibition. Um, but the Challenging Convention exhibition was quite different in the fact that it was the four artists um, compared together in certain points with certain links. And I think that changed as well how we saw some of the paintings because, for example, a lot of Laura Knight's paintings related to Dodd Proctor's and those are quite interesting links to, to make. So kind of like in dialogue, in conversation, um, as friends working together. Mm. Um, whereas the Laura Knight portraits was a lot more individual, I guess. I always think it'd be, yeah, there's so much more work to be done with uh, Dodd Proctor as well, another yeah. artist who, um, again, perhaps enjoyed a very different reputation during her lifetime to the one that she has today, or again, probably not a household name, but um, was, and, wasn't the time. And of course, she was in um, New Lynn as well. Yeah. And so there's a, a lot, I mean, we're very lucky in talking about um, regional art galleries, and we have um, Penley House, which, you know, it's a very small, it's just for Penzance, but it is run by Penzance Town Council, and they do the most amazing shows, and they have introduced us to um, many of the major women artists, and there's usually a major um, publication attached to it, and so I think we're very privileged. And so, you know, when I was doing my work, I was able to look at the women artists who they've shown and the books that have been produced about them, and it gives a really good uh, view of um, how they react re related to each other. Great, thank you. Uh, should we have another online question as well, just whilst the mic's there? So this is a question for Janet. I think, again, we might need... Uh, so this is a question for Janet. How do the nudes from around 1912 and 1913 fit in with the transition from Victorian to modern clothing and attitudes? Do they con coincide with this change? I'm sorry, I don't really um, um, quite follow the question. Um, talking about 1912 and 1913, um, I, I mean, I've made the, the, break, the, the paintings in before um, Dorelia came down, before um, the Johns came down. Um, I mean, there aren't that many of them, and the, the dates aren't very clear, but um, I feel that they are so different, um, those, the two different styles. Um, so can you, yeah, can you repeat, work out exactly what's trying to be? Would you repeat the, yeah, maybe repeat the question while we can have a group think. I think... So I think it's more about the the sort of clothing from the 1912 paintings and the 1913, and whether the, the whether they co coincide with the attitudes that change between the Victorian and modern eras. I guess it's whether that's a moment of transition. Yeah, I think yeah. that's quite difficult. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that Newlyn is so far away from the rest of the world that um, that um, it takes a while for. Um, fashions to catch up um, and, and the important thing that's why Dorelia was so important why you'd got this group of young women Dorelia comes down she's already made her, her name in London and the, the, the art students are following her she comes down to Newlyn into a place I mean I can't uh, um, okay so that Dolly was a London model but the others were local girls and it, it was a whole different world, you know. I mean, it was down in the sticks, really. Uh, it had its own and style. I, I, I think it's important to understand just how revolutionary it was coming all the way mm -hmm. uh, to a place which was... Um, I was trying to explain that in the early days of the New Lynn artists, it was, the male artists went there because it was so dirty and you've got the wonderful fishermen and their wives, and they were living in the... Mm -hmm you know, the middle of the 19th century, and that's how it was. Um, 
Um, but things did change. Um, and, of course, the artists um, were important. They, um, they made a name for themselves. So the fact that the exhibition in Nottingham um, revealed that there were these artists painting in New Lynn. And it, so it slowly modernized. But I think that fashions take a while to catch up. Um, it, it's an interesting question, but I certainly haven't gone into that. I mean, it's, it's, that's quite complicated. And I'm not sure that there's enough... Um, um, information to actually be able to answer it properly. We've got another question here, and then there was one in the front row as well. Um, there is, thank you. Let's get the mic to you. Thank you so much for three such rich and fascinating papers, and I also just wanted to echo a previous comment about how beautifully put together this panel was and how many different perspectives it's given us. I had a question for Ella. Um, whose, I think, uh, case study of the Lang and their sort of curatorial approach to Laura Knight was so fascinating and, and reveals many things that I wasn't aware of, certainly. Um, and, it, and it struck me just to ask um, whether you are able to speak at all about Nottingham's approach to Laura, who, of course, you know, would be their local girl, I would assume. Um, and I would be really interested to know about similarities and differences in the ways in which they have historically and, and perhaps you know, even in, in more recent decades positioned her, championed her, um, the ways in which they've conceptualized her. I'd be really grateful if you'd be able to speak on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I guess from the, the approach of my, my kind of thesis, like looking at it, I haven't looked at Nottingham like throughout my thesis as like a central case study so much, but drawing connections. Um, what I found really interesting is how some some artists are collected based on locality. Um, so I guess what what I want to say is that they've got such a large collection of the Laura Knight works, but um, that their kind of curation is has links with the local public in terms of the way that they see it, and it's kind of a it, it's kind of like a, a interesting way to create a show in one that's in dialogue with the public and there's like a sense of a public identity. I can't talk specifically, I have to say like about any specific like exhibitions at the gallery, um, but just based on my own, my, my own research, the, uh, the sense of the local, the sense of that connection and al almost still like regional pride in having that artist does add this whole new sense of seeing an artist. Um, so sorry that that was very, very general, and I need to look more at uh, Nottingham, I think, in terms of their exhibitions. But thank you. Was it, Janet, you made a comment about um, Laura Knight's um, sort of uh, opinion of, of the cultural landscape of Nottingham, I think, <laughs> as a cultural, was it desert? So she obviously <laughs> had some quite strong opinions about yeah. her, the collection of her hometown. <laughs> I don't know whether they changed over her life, but yeah. anyway, that was quite, I thought that was quite uh, interesting. <laughs> And there was a question in the front row. You've been waiting very patiently. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions, but they're related. So, and um, kind of points, I suppose, as well. So, with Janet talking about um, Cornwall, I think as in around, you know, before the war, just before the war, I think it was very much a liminal space for for people in general, for and for artists in general, but also for women. So that sort of liminal space of um, to experiment, to try out different things, different ways of dressing, different ways of living. You know, so I think that's very much part of that. But also, I wanted to go back to uh, Linda to your um, point you made earlier about um, that. Uh, you know, we can read the, the work without the person who made it. You know, and the gender, etc., is relevant. So you know, I can I can see that. That's one way of looking at it, of course. Mm. Um, but how do you account for um, the way that Laura Knight looks at women's bodies, in, you know, in particular, I mean, the way that she looks at everything, but particularly women's bodies and the desire that's there and that she talks about. Can you start with that and then we can think about Cornwall as a liminal space? Yeah, um, I'll certainly try to, to provide you with some kind of answer. Um, I think Laura Knight is a figure who embodies challenge to uh the sort of um status quo if you like she's a woman who is struggling to make a name for herself in a man's world she is a a, a female student who's not allowed to study from human flesh uh, because she's a woman um 
and I think all of that, that sense of sort of being, um, almost being forced into a position where she has to operate on the fringes of, of mainstream society just to, you know, become what she wants to become. That's something that stays with her. Um, and, you know, she, and in, forgive me. Um, so th that's the sort of starting point. We can trace it from his student days. Then when she discovers that, you know, it's art that she wants to make her name at, uh, and she wants to be able to compete on equal terms with other artists who just so happen to be male, and it's very much a male-dominated environment, obviously. Um, so there's always a sense of determination that she wants to do what a man can do, and she's not going to let the fact that she's a woman prevent her from doing that. So she's in Cornwall, and she's on the cliffs with naked women, which causes a bit of a scandal at the time, and you know, the locals are sort of fine about it because it's Laura Knight, you know, she's, she's one of the locals, she can do what she likes. And so she gets that kind of local endorsement, um, which simply wouldn't have been possible if she'd have been in Nottingham or, you know, trying to sort of paint or draw naked women in the middle of Trafalgar Square. Um, <laughs> so there's always that element of she wants to challenge the status quo whether that's in her personal life, you know, so obviously she, she becomes, you know, she's a big campaigner for, let's say, allowing women to compete on equal terms, because it sort of touches on this idea that I have that really she's not a feminist. She just wants to be able to compete on equal terms. Um, and that manifests itself in her work. So in in a roundabout way, I'll now come to the specifics of the question that you, you put to me. In terms of how she looks at the new body, which in this case happens to be a woman's body, you know, the, the, the female body is kind of the symbol of refined artistic study. The, you know, that's the sort of from ancient times. The, the, the female nude kind of embodies artistic practice in a symbolic sense. Um, and we only have male representations of that body. So Laura Knight is simply saying, well, OK, I'm a woman. I think I'm probably a little bit more adept at representing a woman's body because I've got one myself. So this is my take on a female nude. Um, and of course, the works, and this is another important thing to remember at the time, the fact that she was emboldened enough to, you know, have the audacity not only to paint a, a naked female, but also to, to pose herself in the same space as the artist creating that representation of the female nude, that was extremely divisive, you know, and, and people very simply fell into two categories. The works were either dismissed as vulgar uh, with, with no sort of... Uh, role to play in, in an art historical sense, or they were seen as wonderfully sensational. So I hope that provides you with some kind of answer. Because time is running out. Well, just uh, this space of the, the sort of place that Cornwall allows for exper on the well, edgeness or experimentation. What, what I'd like to say, what we, what we haven't said, and because my talk didn't talk about painting the nudes, the reason that she was able to paint nudes is because Elizabeth Forbes. Um, when uh, she always felt that women should be able to paint the nude, and when she and, and Stanhope Forbes set up the School of Painting, it took a while before they got, they were able to feel they could organise to have to, for their students to paint the nude, and they organised to have um, models come from London, mm -hmm. and they had to. But it, if it hadn't been for them, I don't, there wouldn't have been the opportunities, um, and I think that that is. It, again, we're so it's so far away um, from the main body of, of um, the great art world, yeah. mm. you know, that it, it's a different world. And I think it's quite exciting what actually was achieved. Um, and I feel that um, Laura Knight was there at the right time mm. and she had the opportunities. And because of the other people there, it allowed her to work amongst this group and to do the work that she wanted to do. 
Thank you all. And thank you so much for all the questions in the room and on the online audience. I know I didn't get to everyone, but we've got you know, time this afternoon to keep on talking. So hopefully you'll be able to pose your question or come at it from a different angle. Uh, but thank you so much to our speakers because we've, you've given your papers, which is you know, uh, a task in its own right. And then you know, we've sat here for, for quite a while on picking them and thinking about different interpretations, different angles, different ways in. So you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and speaking of which, it is lunchtime. And um, I can hear some rumbles of Tommy's, I'm sure. Um, and we've got lunch across the um, bay. Maybe you can explain it better than I can, as uh, you know where we're going. So lunch will be across the square from the main entrance. Um, and it's labelled as the event space. Um, the staff downstairs who will be able to point you towards so that. People will point, point, point you in the right direction. But can everybody join with me in thanking our speakers for this first session.
Hi, Danny, are you there?
Hi everyone, welcome back. Hope everyone had a lovely lunch. Um, so this next session is a slightly different format because we have a couple of contributors um, online. So first of all, we have Catherine Wallace, who will be uh, joining us virtually, and um, she'll be talking about drawing and Laura Knight. Then we will have Hannah Starkey um, in person, and then we'll have a film and Q&A with uh, Lily Ford also virtually. Um, and after each paper, there'll be a short question and answer session. So firstly, Catherine Wallace is a freelance art historian, curator, writer and lecturer specialising in British 19th and 20th century art, with a focus on artists based in Cornwall. After de gaining degrees in fine art and art history, Catherine has over 25 years experience as a curator working in the public and commercial sectors in Scotland, London and the southwest of England. Catherine has written many articles and several books on Cornish art and recently contributed two essays for Laura Knight, A Celebration, the publication that accompanied the exhibition in um, Penley. She is an accredited lecturer for the Art Society and runs independent art history courses. We'll see if Catherine is joining us. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, anybody there? <laughs> this is Cornwall calling, Cornwall calling. Alice, can you, is your mic on? Can you speak to it in the mic? Hello, we can hear you. Can you see me? We can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> And can you see my slides okay? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful, great. So historically drawings and other works on paper have often been marginalized by art historians as being peripheral to an artist's main body of work. But for artists, they hold a far greater significance. This was true for Laura Knight, as drawing was her forte throughout her career, which is reflected in her second autobiography, The Magic of a Line. And out of the 80 illustrations, 70 of them are drawings or prints, and they vary from the faintest of line drawings of swans to the darkest aquatints of acrobats and all the shades of grey in between. I have always appreciated the art that sketchbooks and life drawings say about an artist. For me, it is a sign that they want to keep looking and learning. And Laura Knight never stopped doing either of these things. At Nottingham School of Art, um, Laura began by drawing from the plaster cast like all well-trained Victorian students. Although regarded as an essential discipline, she regretted it later and blamed it for bringing a woodenness and a dead look to all her studies and spent years fighting its influence. However, like all artists, her most reliable life model was herself. And in these two early self-portraits in charcoal, we see her natural talent for creating tone through shading and understanding tonal values, as well as creating drama with just black and white by using strong lighting. She depicts herself looking serious and with her hair up, which was an attempt to make herself look older so she would be taken seriously, especially by her mother's students, who she was now teaching how to draw. When her mother died in September 1893, it was Laura's drawings that gave her and her sister an income as she had entered the national competition at South Kensington. And after winning a bronze and a silver medal in 1894, she then won a gold medal in 1895 and sold it for five pounds and seven shillings. She also won the Prince of Wales Scholarship that year, which was an award of 20 pounds for two years. And um, 
in this study of portrait of a girl's head, you can see how she's developing her skills as a draftswoman. And she's getting into more confident, very vigorous mark making, which you can see in the shoulder and hair of the model. And then she's left the subtlety and very keen observation of tonal variation to just the face. It was the technique of painting in oils, however, that Laura knew she had to learn and she got to grips with fairly early on at, whilst at Nottingham School of Art. But being denied the chance to paint the nude as a female student made Laura, I think, even more determined to conquer the art of painting the clothes figure. Laura had a particular style of painting when she was in Stades, and um, she seemed to use a lot of brown outlines like, uh, around things, particularly buildings and um, people, as you can see in this early watercolour of 1899 of the Trestle Bridge at Stades. And for me, it shows uh, that she is uh, at her early attempts at combining figures and landscape and show how she's trying to make the transition from drawing to achieve tonal variation to painting in colour to achieve the same thing. She develops her painting technique whilst in stays, especially in watercolours, which she knew was, was a challenge. And although there is still evidence of drawing in works such as the knitting lesson, um, she is learning how to use colour to create tones and spatial depth in her paintings. By the time she's come to Cornwall, she'd come very bold in her watercolour technique, experimenting with Impressionism, as in this picture of two girls reading in a sunlit garden. Gone are the crude outlines of brown and colour washes and, and the shapes are dictated to by um, the colour and her brushwork. One of the great challenges for any artist is to paint the sea. And Laura had tended to use it just as a backdrop in the distance to her children on the beach in stays. But when she arrived in Cornwall, painting and drawing the sea became more dominant subject in her work. Laura conquered it in watercolour with colourful sunsets such as this evening on a beach. And you can see once again, drawing helped her to work out the tonal differences between sea and rocks and figure. In this drawing of Bathers at the Morna from 1916, we see Laura utilising her vigorous marks in chalk, charcoal again to describe the dark water of a sea pool surrounded by lighter rocks. We can also see how Laura managed to get, convey colour in her drawing, especially when compared with an oil painting of a similar subject, such as the bather. And I'll come back to this aspect of how she managed to capture colour in black and white drawing. By the time the Knights returned to Cornwall on their summer vacations in the 1920s, Laura's style of drawing had become very precise, which was reflected in her tighter, less impressionistic painting technique. But this precise approach was ideally suited for translation into etching, which she developed in the 1920s. In her drawing of Mausel Harbour from above, we can see Laura's created a different texture of the sea to the rocks and the land using a fainter line and shading. And this is accentuated in her etching of the same view called drying nets at Mausel Harbour. Uh, she's able to pick out the outline of individual uh, roof tiles in the foreground whilst leaving other roofs um, and buildings blank without detail. She also uses much blacker lines for two thirds of the etching um, to show they're nearer to us and fainter mark making for the distance. She also, of course, had to tackle the channel challenge of drawing on the etching place in reverse uh, beca because um, etching reverses uh, the image. So uh, Laura Knight um, uh, was very accomplished at drawing and I think one of her boldest series of drawings which she published as a portfolio in 1921 
was of uh, the Russian ballet. And it includes three drawings in simple line of Pavlova, uh, another um, uh, ballet dancer that she became obsessed by. Uh, but I think it's the fourth drawing that's reproduced in the uh, magic of a line uh, from this series that really shows how experimental Laura Knight was with her uh, dances in movement and um, what she was trying to uh, create. As she put it in 1936, I reveled in the joy of line for its own sake, the infinite po possibilities of composition as exemplified by the human body in movement. And the publication of the 21 drawings of the Ballet Russe in uh, 1921 admittedly came off the back of her major exhibition of paintings of the same subject at the Leicester Galleries in 1920. But it was the first of her publications that focused solely on her art of drawing. As the critic P.G. Canoddy described in his foreword, it was a daring thing for her to do, as she was mainly known as a colorist at this point. In her next publication, simply called Laura Knight, a book of drawings published in 1923, she includes some color drawings as illustrations. However, Charles Marriott points out in his foreword that though the positive color is welcome from a decorative point of view, I question if the feeling of color is not at present as, as present as in the black and white drawings. He explains this when he describes Laura Knight's style of drawing as one that takes into account all the conditions in which objects are seen, light, atmosphere, movement, and even color. Both the 21 drawings of the Russian ballet and the 1923 book of drawings are evidence of Laura seeing her drawing as an art form in its own right, and not merely as a background or subsidiary to her paintings. In addition, having two important art critics such as Kanodi and Marriott write about her drawings brought her skills as a draftswoman to the attention of the art world. The practice of drawing rapidly from ballet dancers in movement would also be invaluable when it came to drawing behind the scenes at the theatre. In the days before Instagram and even Instamatic cameras, Laura Knight was able to draw actors such as John Gielgud quickly and capture them off guard in a relaxed moment, having a smoke. The intimacy, intimacy of her dressing room drawings comes from her ability to fit in with performers and their way of light and merge into the background. Her drawing of, um, sorry, her drawing of Van de Avena um, sums this up. And she captures um, uh, her so well in this uh, very intimate scene. And it again translates, the uh, drawing translates into an even more dramatic aquatint uh, where um, just through a change of lighting, Laura has created a much more dramatic scene. So in this way, her drawings are not just a note of a particular time and place or person, but inspire her to make prints which become more imaginative works. Another great opportunity for her to do quick drawings um, and, and be able to fit in with performers was the, the circus. She took her sketchbook everywhere and drew everything in sight. From Salt and Saucy the Elephants to the trapeze artists in their dressing rooms and made many friends, especially the clowns. I love the way Laura draws the clowns off duty behind the scenes, their relaxed, sad faces contrasting with their role of creating laughter. In this charcoal drawing of Joe Craston, who was the head clown in Olympia, she uh, also re reproduced in The Magic of a Line, Laura makes use of the white-faced clown, only making the minimal number of marks to define the clown's face, allowing the paper to do the rest. The techniques Laura um, developed using mixed media, combining drawing with watercolor, crayon and gouache, reached their height in the 1920s and 30s, with works such as this portrait of her closest clown friend, Whimsical Walker. 
And I particularly think this is one of her most stunning um, color drawings. It's also evident in her ability to draw with pastel. Um, she had tremendous sensitivity to the quality, soft quality of pastel combined with watercolour. And you can see that in this wonderful portrait of Pearl Johnson from Baltimore um, when she went there in 1927. Drawing was also a way for Laura to develop her astute visual memory. Without the aid of photography, she often was able to re-envisage a scene from a drawing or a sketch she had made over 20 years earlier. We can see this in her study for the Circus Big Top Alley Up in 1930, and she didn't revisit it as a painting until 1954. So in that way, her sketchbooks would be her continued source of inspiration and uh, archive in her later years when she wasn't able to be on location. Now, there are many examples of drawings as studies for final paintings. And I've just um, picked a couple here and in particularly powerful one for me and as a work of art in its own right is Barbara, the portrait of Barbara Bonner in 1930, which, as we heard, is a study for um, the much um, brighter and more powerful, in some ways, oil painting of ballet girl and dressmaker. But for me, the mixed media drawing has a subtlety about the lighting that shows how far Laura had come for her from her early days in stays. Some of the most fascinating drawings for painting she did was for her post-war oil, the Nuremberg trial of 1946. As a war correspondent, she was offered a press box at the trial, which was very small and was above the dock. As you can see from this photograph, she had to stand up to draw, but it gave her an overview of the trial and an aerial position in which to look down on proceedings. Standing is also possibly why these drawings have such an energy and a dynamism. Her diary of sketches and observation reveal a fascination for Hermann Goering, the former Nazi Reichsmarschall who at one time was deputy to Hitler. And he's the character at the top of the drawing here. Goring was, a, um, Goring was a charismatic presence at the trial, and at times Knight found herself staring intently into, at his great bulky form. Her drawings um, for this painting say so much. There is an, uh, an untidiness, a sense of suffocation, of lack of space and of despair for the accused. There seems to be more of a sense of confrontation in the drawings than in the final painting. What the drawings create in her choice of perspective is the visual dynamism of the parallel lines formed by the back of the benches that are coming through the picture and would have ended at the wall of the end of the room in real life. But of course, in the final painting, she puts the uh, bombed out remains of Nuremberg itself are uh, superimposed in the room and just thus creates this uh, far more powerful juxtaposition, juxtaposition of the consequences of the devastation of war on both sides. Now, the war was a great challenge for Laura Knight as an artist, but she always responded to that challenge in a positive way. She utilized her imagination in graphic works, such as the possible fire in an aircraft factory, which was then used as a safety poster. She also took on board this tremendously ambitious watercolour, um, uh, both in scale and complexity of building bombers in an aircraft hangar, one of her most technically accomplished works in watercolour, in my view. The war also tested her desire to continue to paint on plein air, especially in the hard winter in the Malverns. But again, these graphic skills would have a dual purpose as her drawings and paintings of the Malvern frozen hills would be used for a London underground poster after the war. So her ability to draw and paint in watercolour gave Laura Knight another commercial outlet for her work as a graphic artist and helped her to become a household name with posters of her paintings used on the London underground. 
So to finish with the publication of The Magic of a Line in 1965, her second autobiography, brought a resurgence of Laura Knight's fame, cemented by a retrospective of paintings and drawings at the Royal Academy, followed by one at the Grosvenor Gallery. The last chapter is given the same name as the title of the book, and in it, Laura eulogises on the marvels of drawing and its significance to all artists. There is no limit to the use of the pencil point in the hands of man. Thrones have fallen, millions of human creatures have met their end by the mere scrawl of a line. But a pencil is not limited to violence. It provides the means for man to reveal to man the sacred depths of his innermost self. Thank you very much. Hi, Catherine. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see me? Uh, just about. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really fascinating and um, such a treat to be able to look at her mark making on this huge screen. Great. I noticed so many things that I hadn't even noticed before, even looking at the artworks in the exhibition. Yeah. Can I just start by saying I came up to Milton Keynes in October last year to visit family and I saw the show and it blew me away. And I have to say, you didn't ignore her drawings. And I love all the inclusion of her sketchbooks and the watercolours. And I think it's an absolutely fantastic exhibition. And you should be really congratulated. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> And actually, you're absolutely right. One of the most remarked upon things in the exhibition um, that we've had from visitors are the early drawings because they're just, they blow people away and they can't believe that she was that accomplished at such a young age. Um, it really starts the exhibition off on a really positive um, note. And then to be able to see, as your talk demonstrated, her, the change in her style with the ballet drawings and to be able to include some of her sketchbooks alongside the finished works as well is, is incredible. Um, if I can start by asking a question, I was struck in your talk by how Knight obviously felt that drawing was a very important part of her practice and the fact she named her autobiography The Magic of a Line and she chose to publish books of drawing. Um, was that common for artists? Is that quite unique to Laura Knight or is that something other artists were doing at the time? And what do you think her kind of main motivation for pushing her drawing uh, forward in those ways was? Um, I think it was quite unusual. Um, I mean, I, I think people did portfolios of prints and drawings um, as an, uh, uh, an adjunct to making money. And um, I mean, Wyndham Lewis produced a portfolio of drawings in 1919, which were a series of his um, drawings made into prints. And um, uh, I also think... Uh, etchings when she got into etchings in the 1920s producing limited editions of etchings in portfolio were, was another common way for artists to um, earn a living of course uh, Mr Joshua Reynolds started all that didn't he in the 18th century so it was seen as um, and as somebody pointed out this morning you know um, Laura Knight was a commercial artist and her, one of her uh, big motivations was never to be poor again. And I think uh, making her drawings into a commercial success by producing them as prints was a, a, a another way of earning a living. So I wouldn't say it was uh, an exceptional thing, but as um, um, Lady this morning said, Laura always wanted to compete and compete with her male counterparts and, and prove that she could produce a portfolio of drawings and etchings like her, her colleagues. So I think that was uh, one of the things, but I think the ballet of uh, the drawings of the ballet really came out of that love and obsession for um, ballet dancers and trying to capture their movement. And um, I thought the discussion this morning was interesting about 
how, of course, you know, um, uh, Laura Knight was always a figurative artist. But it's those drawings that are the only thing I think, um, someone might disagree, that pushes the boundaries of her figurative painting and drawing because she's um, pursuing this um, a desire to capture movement and her work almost becomes abstract because of it. But, of course, she would have abhorred that label because, like so many of her contemporaries, like Munnings and Lamorna Birch, who she met in Cornwall, they were all traditionalists, you know, and um, I don't really think that they um, contemplated uh, much of modernism. Uh, they were uh, very much rooted in their academic training. That's my thoughts anyway. Thank you. I think we have a question in the room. Sorry, it's not so much a question. It's more an observation in conjunction with the Ballyroos portfolio. There was already a very strong tradition of producing portfolios of the Bally Bruce. And I think that Laura Knight was tapping into that very much, as you say, following on from her exhibition. And another question uh, at the front here. Uh, yes, yeah, so just following on from what you were saying about those very sort of minimalist drawings of the ballet dancers, and um, I think she talks about it, as you say, as being just to do with the movement and capturing that. But um, given, as you were saying, that they, they do have this sort of modernist look, do you think she was also looking at um, the works of other artists in that sort of line? Um, yeah, uh, for sure. But I, I, <laughs> I think she also... Um, um, she, she started uh, getting more interested in um, being able to draw uh, the ballet uh, dancers um, in a better way because Lopakova, who she befriended, uh, according to her biog auto first autobiography, um, was, came over and said, uh, suggested they weren't very good and that she needed to get closer. Uh, and to um, uh, and, and then got invited to go backstage so that she could observe uh, the dancers in their dressing room and um, getting prepared to go on the stage. So I think um, she she wanted to research it to um, a far greater um, degree of detail and maybe wasn't very confident to start with about her drawings of the dancers because the dancer had, herself had criticised them. So I think uh, she, um, I think uh, Laura Knight was always very um, bullish about her work and that she didn't really go with convention of her day. And maybe she just wanted to do it because it was her artistic exploration. And I think the other fundamental fact is that she, uh, as Harold always suggested, that secretly she wanted to be a performer herself. And hence the drawings, not just of the ballet, but of the circus and this uh, wanting to be close to um, uh, people who performed. And um, you could extend that by saying that her own art became a bit of a performance, too, because she exaggerated a lot of the movement and colours in the both the ballet and the circus performers. So, um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I feel about it. Thank you. I think we've got some questions coming in online. So whilst we, I can see, sorry, this is a question from Phil, and he says, whilst I can see that many works will be pencil-based, do we know in what order on any given individual painting her work, her other different media, of example, gouache, watercolour, wax crayon, body colour, chalk, and charcoal were applied? Ooh. So does that mean in which order they were painted or in which order she put the gouache, watercolour, wax crayon and body colour on? I think it means which order she put the materials on in. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you. Great. Um, I think it's uh, more standard practice. I don't um, remember actually talking about it. She talks about painting technique more. Um, but... Um, I suspect paper conservators could tell you more about that than anybody else, because if you if they analysed her drawings, they probably could work out the layering of the different media. 
but um, my guess would be that she always started with charcoal and pencil and she moved into the uh, works with um, uh, body colour and watercolour and then used uh, chalks and pastels to highlight with. Um, as somebody who's had a go at all those things myself, that's the order I would do them in. <laughs> and I think we had another question in the room here. Thank you so much for such a wonderful paper. And you made the argument so compellingly as to how central drawing was to her own artistic practice. This is possibly a slightly left field question, but it just made me think, do we know what, um, whether, whether she had, what sort of collection she may have had of drawings, and which artist she was looking at graphically for inspiration or influence or, or anything else at all? Um. I think it was more, um, I mean, obviously, uh, we haven't mentioned Harold much, have we, today? But I think he was um, a tremendous influence early on, and especially at art school, she does write about that. And I think she their practice, although they had separate studios, um, I think they were always looking at each other's work. Uh, I don't know if she collected other people's work. Uh, I couldn't tell you that. Um, I think as this morning's implication was that um, uh, her art was a way of making money. And when she did have money, um, she bought fur coats and, um, you know, practical things. And I think she was very supportive of other artists like uh, Lamorna Birch. And I suspect because he was so prolific, um, having created 20,000 works of art. I'm sure she had several Lamorna Birches. And I love things like the fact that they would exchange Christmas cards and New Year's Day cards and they'd have a work of art on them. So, um, and that's how she sent uh, letters with drawings on as well. So, but as, a, as to um, uh, a consumer, I, I doubt it. Um, I think there's um, a real kind of... Um, earnestness in Laura Knight about the fact that art was for her was a it was a way of life as it was for Harold but it was a way of earning a living and um uh, yeah I, I think uh, she must have been informed by uh, other um drawings but I think she admired paintings as as much um again we mentioned the show of Newland artists at Nottingham Art Gallery in 1894 which uh, did impress her and of course she also with Harold they went to Holland three times um, what, um, what after they got married so they were looking at Dutch art a lot um, but I think it was more for um, painting uh, technique rather than um, draftsmanship um, and I think drawings really were her way of analyzing the world um, making her mental notes like I say I think Laura Knight like all great artists, had a very good visual memory. And one way you work on that is by drawing a lot and drawing from memory as well. So um, I think she kind of saw it almost as um, like you, if you're a writer, you would take notes. Um, and if you're an artist, you draw everything you see. And I think she was too busy, um, really. Um, I know she did go and see art when she was judging uh, in America. She had to judge other people's art, didn't she, at the Carnegie Institute. So she knew what was going on. And um, I think she did have, um, I think Dodd Proctor, we've mentioned Dodd's work. Dog was, Dodd was a major influence on Laura's painting, especially of the nude, I think. Um, but as far as I know, she didn't own a Dodd Proctor, but I'm sure um, the family could tell me whether that's right or wrong. But yeah, I think she was... Um, um, a, a creator and um, I think she appreciated uh, a lot of art that was around her both contemporary and historic but I don't think necessarily she spent her money on it. Catherine thank you so much um, please stay on the line online and in the chat and um, we'll do we'll go through the other sessions and um, thanks for the technology not letting us down. Great. Thank you.
And next we welcome artist Hannah Starkey, who will be presenting an imagined conversation with Laura Knight. Um, since the late 90s, Hannah Starkey has dedicated her work to women and the ways in which photography has shaped ideas about what it means to be female. Known for her cinematic mise-en-scene, Starkey constru constructs portraits of women of different generations, often situated in everyday urban contexts. Hannah. Ah, this is what you all look like. Um, hello, everybody. I will press. You know what? I forgot to find out how this works, but. Oh, okay. Where's the clicker? He's got the clicker. Oh, that's the clicker. Look, does that look like a clicker to you? Anyway. Um, so, hello, and down, okay. Okay, we'll go through all the buttons. Oops, here we go, okay. Um, so, uh, I'm never one for hanging around the podium. I like to kind of walk around. This is a live experience, which is uh, a different type of um, energy. Um, I'm talking for 15, 20 minutes. Does someone want to time me? Have you got a, can you do me a 5, a 10, and a 15, please? Um, and I'm going to try and do something that is experimental, and I haven't worked out if it works yet, because it has to be live and in front of an audience. Um, That'd be interesting. Like, it's a fixed camera, mm. so we can't see you people But you can hear me. Okay, I'll come back over there in a bit. My priority is the people who've got the bums on their seats at the minute. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> I am going to try and have a conversation between a dead female artist and an alive one. I'm the alive one, obviously. Um, I am a photographer. This is my work. And I am going to talk about Laura Knight's work. Self-Portrait, 1913. Uh, my work, untitled May 1997, 90, is, what, 75 years apart. Um, interesting that Laura was kind of at the turn of the century. I was at, towards the end of the 20th century and, um, and into a new millennium, into a whole new age, the digital age, a revolution in itself. Um, I actually didn't know who Laura Knight was. I know that's a terrible omission from an artist, but that, w that is the reality. And, you know, as a female artist, I do look for female, however you want to um, think of that or identify with it, but I look to women who have been artists before me as some kind of guidance, some kind of role models. Um, so it's amazing that I hadn't come across Laura Knight, but I think my world was much more in photography. So uh, 1997, at the Royal College, doing an MA in photography, I produced this work for my degree show. Um, I, I was 26, and I guess Laura was 36 when she made this work. Um, and a lot happens in those 10 years to an artist. Um, so. There were quite a few things that I was grappling with at the time, and yet towards the end of the 20th century, you'd have thought this was not an issue. But first of all, I was working in photography. Um, the British art scene are a little bit behind the curve when it comes to photography, and there was a long time that they thought of it as lesser, if not, not art. Um, so I had that to contend with, but I also felt that I was working in a very male-dominated dominated industry and where effectively what was peddled was the male gaze. And as a young woman, I felt that male gaze. You know, up to about 15, I was, I didn't identify necessarily with gender. And the minute the male gaze is on you as a young woman, which has gone into overdrive now, 
um, that kind of makes you realize that uh, we're kind of all a, a victim of this kind of consumption and objectification and then inevitably self-objectification of women. So I wanted to make work that with photography um, that actually when I made this work it wasn't really about feminism or being a female artist. It was really coming from being a photographer, finding my own language um, and kind of trying to find a hybrid between the different outlets and different genres of photography. So you'd advertising, fashion, documentary, um, and I made this hybrid, but I had women as my subject matter, which wasn't that intentional. It just happened to be all the other pictures were men and went as successful. So it wasn't a feminist agenda to begin with. What made it into a feminist agenda was my experience of being a young female artist in the art world. Um, and one thing I love about Laura Knight, um, and I, I can feel it in her work, is her, her rebelliousness. You know, her kind of, whatever constraint she was working in at her time, and bear in mind this is beginning of the 20th century, the suffragettes were just coming through. She, she was a really smart operator in how she got information through within the codes and status quo of the day. And I think, you know, in a way, that's what I've tried to do in my own work, is to, is to make it so, how can I say this, every day, I mean, obviously it's changed in the last uh, 25 years I've been working. Um, but I wanted it to be a kind of uh, a slower look at what photography can do in terms of representing the everyday. And it was really about the human condition I was making work ab about. But the work was very successful. There were seven pictures in the degree show, and um, I got a lot of press from it. And I realized that the critics, who were mostly male, and the press um, were determined to put me into this little camp of feminist uh, artists, um, which I now have to say that I think that's a massive compliment. But at the time, I thought, why can you not make work with women in it? Um, and it has to be kind of um, pigeonholed. You know, if, these, if this was a group of men or two men sitting at a table, it wouldn't be pigeonholed in the same way. So the fact that the human condition seemed to only apply to men, um, and if you were photographing women, you were, you were, um, you were a feminist artist, you were put into a pigeonhole, and you were therefore easily dismissed. Um, because if you're working with female subject matter, particularly in the mid-90s, it's like, yeah, well, that's for somebody else. That's for a different audience. We don't need to concern ourselves about it. So for me, it was the resistance to such quiet pictures of women that really began to shape the, the, the future of my career. So subsequently, I dedicated my practice photography to the representation of women. Obviously, women is a massive category and you can't generalize. So it's not all women, but it's some women. And what it intends to do is present a different way of picturing women that was directly opposed to the way I had been, how can I say, I guess advertised to through images of what it meant to be female. So I guess I was well aware of what the male gaze meant, but I didn't know what the female gaze meant. Um, and then, so I've just spent 25 years trying to find that out, and I actually still don't know yet. Um, so here we are. These are the two pictures, two, one painting, one photography. Um, the, uh, Laura's uh, uh, self-portrait, I actually, even though I didn't know anything about Laura, her, a little cutout that I'd made maybe from a, newspaper or something was on my studio wall for a long time. And uh, um, I just loved looking at it. I constantly had a conversation with it, even though I didn't really know very much about it. But stylistically, aesthetically, how it's constructed, it's a female um, perspective, I was drawn to it. 
Um, and I think it might have been this tiny picture on my studio wall for about 10 years before Milton Keynes Gallery came and said, um, would you like to do a talk about Laura Knight? So I had to kind of backtrack, learn about Laura Knight, realize that her painting had been one of the biggest influences in my work, um, even sort of subliminally, because when something's on your wall for 10 years, you'd stop seeing it. Um, and thought about what I kind of want to present more than anything is how we, how we operate with a still image, whether it's painting, whether it's um, a still, silent, two-dimensional representation. Um, and you know when you go to a gallery and you're, you look at a painting or a photograph or whatever, and you have this internal conversation about it um, with yourself, and it's, you're, you're talking to the painting, and through the painting you're talking to the artist, and you're trying to find a kind of, uh, I guess, an energy or answers or something. So I thought it would be nice to take you into my studio. This is my studio wall. And kind of, and I need the lights down for this, if that's possible, um, kind of take you into my mind, because the studio, an artist's studio, is the kind of uh, physical space that represents this inside their head. So uh, welcome to Inside My Mind. Um, so there they are. And again. I was going to hypnotize you with this and go deeper and deeper, but then I forgot it's not a seance. Um, and here we go. So when I was looking at Laura Knight's pictures, or painting, and trying to find answers for myself, um, I wasn't necessarily thinking about my work but this is maybe just for the audience, so you have something else to look at. I was thinking about all sorts of things, like what it meant to be a female artist, um, how she managed to do a self-portrait with a nude. Just, I was thinking about, given the time and the context, all the rules that she broke. And for me, they're all in this painting. And as a female artist, which I still identify myself with, um, as, and that's, the, if I can just explain that, you know, over the 20th century where women have to constantly kind of reinvent themselves to be able to be visible, I had come towards the end of the 20, 20th century where it was still very much a man's game and women were kind of ridiculed in public, you know, you could say to the woman driver, that sort of thing. And so I felt that certainly in photography and in, in uh, the art world, that um, women were kind of trying to stay out of the gender discussion to some, it depends what kind of artist you were and what period you were working in, but I had observed that women were, um, they hated the idea of being labeled according to gender, and I completely understand that. And from my understanding, it was because you could detract from an artwork if, if you kind of give it a gender. So if it was a, a painting by a woman, you could think of it as lesser. So I understand why, before me, historically, women had stayed away from actually calling themselves uh, female artists. But when I came around in the late 70s, I decided to take that title um, and all the, the, the complications that come with seeing yourself as a female artist and, by extension, presenting the female experience. Um, so, <sighs> fucking hell. I mean, this must have really pissed a lot of people off when this came out. And I love her. For me, she's nonchalant, you know? She's in the picture, you're looking over the shoulder, and she has a... She's not even performing for, you know, if you think about the, 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 the viewer as a lens, she's not even performing for the viewer. She has her back to the, to the viewer and sort of with a little nod of her head, I guess, kind of inviting us in to experience this picture. 
Me, as an artist and a woman, I always feel like I am the fourth person in this picture. So there is the real life, um, the uh, representation, and then the artist herself. And then I am the fourth viewer for me. So I'm trying to work out what, uh, what she's trying to say to me. So, okay. Um, I'm going to turn my back on you, which signifies that you're now in my brain. And, and try and learn something from this picture that might help my own work. Um, formally, it's just perfect. Attention to detail. I remember in the 90s when I was studying um, art, there was this idea that attention to detail was particularly feminine uh, um, pursuit. And I guess that comes from crafts and all that sort of stuff. But. Um, I love her attention to detail and I, she, she is a puzzle to me because she is a woman that was, seems to me very political in her art, but not necessarily political in how she conducted herself in the world. And I guess that would have been because you had to play the game. Um, so her, this image speaks to me at a time when women couldn't even represent themselves. You know, the, the male gaze, but women were not encouraged to, uh, to paint nudes, which is kind of ironic now because it's all about sending nudes and women are kind of taking ownership and authorship of, of sending nudes, I guess. Although it's kind of weird now because there's a platform called OnlyFans and I realize I'm jumping uh, 100 years. But only fans, you know, where you can go online, you can do some kind of sex work, and you earn money to buy whatever you want to buy. What I find fascinating about that, and I, I only got this information yesterday talking to some random person on the street, but uh, on, um, on this platform, the woman who is selling a sexual act she only frames her body. She cuts off her head and her uh, identity. And I thought, that's a really interesting way to do a nude. Um, and I guess, in a way, Laura Knight has done that. You know, she's, she's turned her, her female figure away from the consuming gaze. And I guess it's kind of in an attempt to appreciate the female body as something other than erotic or titillating or something that can be beautiful. How can I say this? In all shapes and forms in its own right without um, having to perform. Um, she, I love what Laura wore. You know, she's obviously a smart cookie and she had a, I guess a branding, where a, a black fedora, a red smock, which is very, um, it's block colors, it's stylistic, and it is a type of branding. And I love that she's painted herself in her artist's gear. Um, like I said, I didn't know Laura Knight. I had to write a little bit in the catalog, so I got to know a little bit about it, but I didn't want to know too much because it's actually quite nice coming to a painting without the narrative attached to it and just pulling out. So, Laura, tell me, how did this great masterwork come about? I mean, I know you can't answer me, but I can sort of surmise that this was an act of defiance, a quiet um, self-portrait of an artist at work. Um, that kind of slipped through the political uh, digression, I guess, of a woman um, painting a female nude. Um, it's so understated, but yet such a dangerous image, particularly for that time. If you think the suffragettes were coming through, all these, I mean, Okay, it's hard to compare um, women's lives now with women's lives then, but you can imagine that the, the, the shitness of their lives, by the time the suffragettes came through, they were so anarchic and so kind of um, pushed by the, the, the realization that as a woman, it's very hard to make your way in the world. Um, and 
you can so easily be dismissed and you have to put on a kind of persona, a bravado, a kind of... So for me, when Laura and I were saying, this is the best work I've ever produced, which apparently she said about a lot of her paintings, I really like that attitude. That is a really kick-ass kind of, I will decide. And um, I like that about her. So Laura, you give me a little bit of confidence, a little bit of female strength. I can't imagine what your life was like then. I mean, you had the suffragettes, you had World War I, you had the Irish War of Independence. There's so much political upheaval in the world. And yet you were part of the longest revolution in history, which is still running, which is the equality of women. Um, I wonder, Laura, what you would make of the world today. Um, as you know, women have always had to try and negotiate this kind of objectification. Um, what would you make of the world now? Because you were obviously a forerunner in, uh, I guess, the emancipation of women from the male gaze, in my opinion. So this female nude is not seeing through a male prism. For me, as a woman, I see, I, I, you speak to me, Laura. Sorry, we're jumping in now. It's harder than I thought. Um, and I, you know, just listening to all the speakers, I know too much now, so it's very hard for me to be objective about this painting now. Um, but she, those, those three brilliant, four brilliant papers that we've heard from already were, are, are just, there's so much to you. You were so prolific. And I wondered, is that because you didn't have children? And then I wondered about what it was like then as a female artist, which was fairly rare, if not having children was a conscious decision. Because when I came into the art world in the 90s, there were a lot of female artists, well-known female artists, who had chosen not to have children. And I can remember when I was first pregnant and I won an award um, when I was about 30. And it was, it, it, it was uh, a scenario where I, the, the, the kind of prize of being announced, it was me. I walked up to pick up the prize and I was nine months, nine months pregnant. And I tell you, I could hear a, an audible sigh of relief when that audience, which was mainly male, <clears throat> urban city, hard, gritty uh, audience. Um, I, could, I could feel this kind of sigh of, oh my God, she's pregnant, that's fine. We'll just, she's off the competitive list now. And that is kind of what happens to women. So Laura, you were definitely on to something. Although, Laura, I had two daughters, so it made it impossible for me not to respond visually to my own life, and then the lives of my daughters, particularly about imagery and how female identity is shaped through these images, whether it's advertising, Instagram, all of those sort of things. I actually feel we're in a less liberal time than we were and a kind of, and a, and a point where gender has been so hyper, um, we're so hyper vigilant about our gender and how our gender is perceived or performed, I guess, because gender is performance more than any, it's a social construct. Um, and all these rules that were kind of laid at the feet of women when you were working don't exist anymore. You can be whoever you want. You can choose your sexual identity, you can change your sexual identity. People are allowed to be themselves now. I think, but I, I don't know what point that comes because we are living in such a, a visual culture, you know, photography is king, it is us and we are it, um, that I think it's really hard to find your identity now because uh, the societal construct of gender and then the fact that in our world, we are sold stuff 24 seven. Everything is advertising, whether it's Instagram, whatever it is, we are constantly being advertised to. 
And uh, traditionally, that would have meant sort of using the female bo body to sell stuff. Um, and that is still very much happening on Instagram, 14, 15 year olds. I mean, it's less genderized now, but there's still a performance in masculinity and femininity. And there's a very narrow idea of what it means to be female, in my view, of what my girls have grown up with, which is why I totally understand and love the explosion in, in the definition of what it means to be female. That's really important to me because it's how it should be and it takes the pressure of all of us. Although marketers will find some way to tell you you're not good enough and you need this product to make yourself better. So you didn't have the heavy onslaught of advertising, Laura, but you did have the, the, the fire in your belly, the, the kind of absolute annoyance at not being able to learn how to paint a representation of your own female body. That must have pushed you forward into making this painting in 1913, which I guess is relic 36. Yeah, I guess that's kind of maybe when you do make your uh, masterwork. I made mine at 26, and that's quite complicated because then you've got a whole life you have to live with that image being from uh, your, your um, mid-20s. Um, okay, I see a big knot there. Um, I can see that Laura and I, we had this idea about the gaze, the play of the gaze, the use of mirrors, where is the viewer, how can you get the viewer into the image, how can you slow down the viewer's consumption of the image, because particularly in photography where we see it in about 13 millionth of a second, you know, we understand what a photograph's of before we've even consciously registered it. I wanted to make photography that was big, so it's about a meter by a meter and a half to kind of emulate the, the great masters that I saw in all the museums, National Gallery. They were all male painters with female subject matter. I wanted to use scale and I, um, the Maison scene cinematic is kind of by accident, but that's become my language. Um, and you know, there's so much to, I love flicking between these two images because it's, oops, sorry. It's, um, I'm still learning from her, and I guess for the rest of my life, I will go back to her painting and ask it more questions. And actually, I could talk to you, my time's run up, I could talk to you for hours as like a little listener in her to Laura and I's conversation, but maybe another time. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think she was the forerunner of the eventual emancipation of women from the male gaze that was brought through by photography in the late 20th, early 21st century. Um, and there it is. That's it. Thank you. Oh, nearly turn over. Oh, I see okay. Is that okay? <laughs> now, I notice when people sit here, half of their face is lit and the other half is like in shadow. Or you need to sit up. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Hudson <laughs> Water. <laughs> I just wanted to give a tiny little bit of background of how, how this kind of came about. Um, when we were working on the exhibition catalogue, we thought it was really important to ask contemporary artists to, for their response to the work, to see, to see what Laura Knight's work meant for people practicing today. And um, we invited five people to contribute. And your name came up quite early on because we just saw similarities, particularly mm. in composition. Mm. Subject matter. And I didn't know what you thought when we first emailed you to, did you think it was just a, thought, a wacky Laura request? Knight? <laughs> But it was incredible that your response was that you'd had the postcard in your studio and you mm. didn't know who she was. And, and then your response in the catalogue was fascinating. I loved. I think you called it a treading on toes image, the self-portrait. Yeah, I mean, just the, I've had this in my career, just the pushback from, that she got for that painting. Um, you know, the fact that critics could say it was vulgar or, or whatever else is so, um, it's so interesting to me because when you get 
uh, critique or feedback like that coming from a particular part of the establishment, you know you're onto something good. You know that you've made a dangerous image because they don't like it. Um, and my question to Laura Knight, if she was here, would also be that, because the painting from 1913, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> It's then stayed with her in her studio until after her death. God, that's such a sad story. So mm. she exhibited it quite regularly. Sad story, okay. And no one, no one bought it. But she didn't. A lot of other works she destroyed, she repainted. That stayed with her. Well, an art historian friend of mine pointed out because I, I, I wondered with that painting in her studio. Was it a reminder of, I guess, the slap in the face or the put down that she got, and it kind of gave her resilience and strength? Um, I mean, the fact that she kept it in her studio until, I mean, it was in her studio after she died, they cleared it out. Um, and the fact that she knew she had made a significantly important painting in the medium which she was working with and had kind of advanced the medium in that sense. Um, to see this picture for, what, she died in the 70s, so she'd been looking at this picture for 53 years. Mm. 53 years, is it? Yeah. Um, and, you know, how did that feel? Did yeah. that feel like I'm in a boys' club? This, I will never get good work out there because this is all controlled. Um, or did she think... Uh, I don't know what it meant to her. I'd love, that's what I'd love to ask her. Did this hurt you or did it, um, did it kind of give you strength and a fire in your belly mm. to fight back? Any questions in the room? That? Uh, right at the front, Rasheen. <coughs> oh, it's for the online audience. Right, fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, fantastic. Really enjoyed that. Really innovative. Um, you know, I was just thinking for the first time after looking at that painting in reproduction for years, she, how did she do it? Because it's, it's from behind, isn't it? So do you think she used to photograph? I did wonder about her use of photography. Um... To my knowledge, she didn't use photographs. I've... Annette? Anyone? I, I haven't seen any photographs that she's... Yeah. Can I interject? So, you know, self-portrait from behind. Mm. You know, how, who'd, who'd done that before? You know, what, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Well, it's such a simple gesture, but it's so powerful, actually. If you block the gaze, it frustrates people, particularly certain types of people who want to consume an image of a woman's body in a particular way. You know, it, it's... She's, she's used her back to block the painting, but also to kind of block the nude a little bit as well. Um, and I guess that's the amazing thing about painting in comparison to photography, although that's probably changed now with Photoshop. But in photography, you had to locate it in the world first to can then bring it into photography, whereas I've always kind of thought that painters were free I don't think it's necessarily harder or easier, but they were free to just draw from their imagination. Um, so I imagine she knew what she, her back looked like or what she wanted it to look like. Um, it's a very striking portrait of her, and it's like a, blo a block abstract of her. Um, yeah. I did it by accident, actually. I did it because I, as a woman, wanted to turn away and before I knew it, all my women in my pictures were turning away. They have to turn back, though, at some point. It is a fantastic example of I think, what Linda was saying this morning about this sort of the systems of looking. And mm. the more you look, the more complicated the systems of looking and, and complex in how they block you as a viewer. Mm, absolutely. I mean, you want the eye to linger a little longer, particularly on photography. Um. Another question at the front here. Yeah. 
Yeah, just a question about your own practice in relation to Laura Knight. Um, it sounds like a lot of it's kind of consequential that you focus on the same themes, but now that you know who the artist is responsible for the mm. picture, are you planning to make any work in direct response to that or including that image or, or anything like that? I think actually when I look at the composition and her choice of colour uh, and how a political mess a, a painting can or an image can hide a political message and the subtler it is the better i think that's really interesting i mean at some point in my career when i decided that the boys club were probably never going to let me in that i began to talk to women i mean my work is about talking to women and even though at the beginning of my career that was the last thing i wanted to do was cut out my male audience but just the experience of it and the unnecessary shit that some women have to put up with in the art world, you, you find yourself um, uh, going it alone, really. And you find solace in the women that you're photographing, the collaborative experience. And also, you're kind of trying to find out what their life is like and how it compares to yours, and if they have any idea of how you'd be female in this world, either. Great, thank you. Oh, there's one over oh, there. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi, Hannah. Um, it's really interesting, and I love that conversation. Um, and I noticed that on the wall you always had a Artemisia Gentileschi, I think it was. I did, yes. Yes. I know. And I just thought, obviously, self-portraiture, women, a wonderful painting in the Royal Collection, her self-portrait allegory of painting. I just wondered mm. if that had you know, Oh, yeah, I went to see that show yeah. and was blown away. <laughs> I mean, I had sort of got to the point where I dismissed a lot of that sort of painting because it wasn't speaking to me. But when I got to her... Um, I mean, yeah, you know, for me, she is the female perspective. And I know we're in a non-gendered world and the female perspective probably hasn't got, I don't know if it's ever had any value, but um, just how she handles bodies, gestures, expressions, it was really releasing and freeing for me to kind of make my women more robust, actually. So she was massive influence. You see, the sad thing about women artists is they all have a story of rejection. So they're all little anarchists in the end. Um, Thank you so much. much that was fantastic. Thank you. Oh, I completely ignored it. Still working. Um, so next, we're first going to see a film um, by Lily Ford, and then Lily will come online and be available for questions. Uh, Lily Ford is a filmmaker and historian. Her book, Taking to the Air: An Illustrated History of Flight, came out in 2018. She's undertaking an investigation of women behind the scenes in early British aviation, with text and film outputs. She's made a number of research film, films, including Chasing the Revolution, Mary Langer, Psychoanalysis and Society, and Humbrol Art, The Paintings of George Shaw. She is deputy director of the Derek Jarman Lab at Birkbeck and teaches on the Pittsburgh London Film Programme. Um, so I should say, for those online, um, It'll, the film will be available on the Zoom, but we're also putting out a link in case the Zoom buffers or goes grainy.
Hi, can you guys hear me if I jump in before the video? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, great. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for making this a hybrid event. It's really great to be able to be part of it despite uh, COVID. Um, I'll just say a few words before you start watching the film. Um, I actually encountered Laura Knight through Barrage Balloons about 10 years ago while I was looking into the history of flight. I became quite interested in the balloons and representations of them. Um, but couldn't quite work out kind of how to talk about them or write about them. And when I saw um, this event was on, got very excited about um, using kind of more of my recent experience to make a film about them instead and to kind of draw on different kinds of visual material about them and uh, maybe show my workings in a bit more of a research film context. So um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say now, but I look forward to some questions or comments afterwards. Um, is there now a link in the Zoom? Yes, so there's a link in the Zoom. So if people on Zoom find it uh, fuzzy or if it's buffering a lot, then please just go to the Vimeo link and watch it there instead. Um, all right, thank you very much. See you later. This is a film about bodies. Bodies in flight and bodies on the ground. It's about the less glamorous side of wartime aviation. Not the knights of the air, but their sturdy ground-bound attendants. Not the spitfires, but the blimps. It's about an experiment where for 18 months, women were put in charge of a crucial part of air defense. An unusual scenario with unconventional munitions. Lumbering, capricious, floppy, yet lethal. They and their operators were figures of fun, under or wrongly represented. They're one of the kind of unspoken things of the war. Any black and white film of the war, you will see barrage balloons either being flown from a ship or up in the sky over London, and nobody ever talks about them. full of praise for the work of the Royal Air Force. So here's a little tribute to spare for some more of the men on the ground, the men on the barrage balloon. They too are part of the great organization of the RAF, though they never achieve the headlines. This is just a brief outline of their daily work, the routine job of sending up a sentinel into the sky. The traditional male balloon crew was 10, ten men and two non-commissioned officers. In warfare, for every new method of attack, a new method of defense is found. The uh, modern threat is, of course, the bomber, and the most deadly method is dive bombing. That is, pointing the airplane at the objective and diving full out at it. You, you take an aircraft, and the most accurate way of bombing was to come straight down. And so the Germans would come down about 3,000 foot, an alarm would go off in the cockpit, release the bombs, and come out of the dive. Means used to prevent this dive bombing are, of course, your balloon. The balloons really were a major deterrent. I, I've talked to a Luftwaffe pilot and he told me it was one of their big fears. They never knew for sure if they were going to hit a, hit a balloon. Um, it's a very hard thing to quantify, but they were effective. Despite the efficacy and ubiquity of the balloons, their reputation was unstable. They terrified some children. Books were published to explain their presence and give them personalities. Balloon work also suffered from low esteem. 
This newsreel sought to bolster the masculine prowess of a balloon squadron by gendering the balloon female. One of the most wonderful things about Britain's balloon barrage is the good behaviour of the balloons. But here is one that disgraced herself. In a high wind, she came over temperamental. The crew chased her and bullied her, but she took no notice. She wanted to dance the bumps a daisy. But it wasn't long before balloons would actually be managed by women, some 15,000 of them. At the beginning of the war, you had the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and um, you know they, they were sort of seen as very delicate creatures by a lot of the top brass. Um, they were good for making tea, they were good for typing and driving, and, and doing all sorts of other things. But the thought of women taking up arms uh, to repel the invaders was, was kind of a, a bit beyond the pale. Um, but of course, people didn't realise how short we were of manpower. I want to join the WAF as a balloon operator. Good. We want girls like you to release as many men as possible for other work. On the 5th of May 1941, a 10-week trial was held at Cardingham, and it was a great success. And the first crew of fully trained female balloon operators left Cardington on the 10th of July 1941. Many of the male officers expected it to fail. There was a, there was a great deal of kind of angst about uh, women going into it. In October 1941, the Air Ministry approached Dame Laura Knight, who had already completed several portraits of medalled military women for the War Artists' Advisory Committee, or WAC. Knight was invited to visit a barrage balloon centre. The WAC got wind of this and commissioned a painting of fabric workers. The balloons were made by various fa fabric companies. So rolls of fabric would be sort of cut into gauze panels and then they would be sewn in and glued in and stitched in. The, the material came already rubberized and the external side of it was covered in a, an aluminium powder. The hangar doors were open for Knight's benefit. The dope used to revarnish damaged fabric was poisonous. Just as in the First World War, the task of working with these toxic varnishes was given to women, with nothing but a milk ration as compensation. Looking at the painting in the context of Knight's oeuvre, it's not hard to see a fit. She was interested in the postures and groupings of collective work, whether by fishermen and women, ballerinas or circus performers. Before the war she had painted dancers backstage, the canvas curtain hanging behind them, the tulle of their skirts buoyant and frothy around their seated figures, their upper bodies momentarily at rest. The sheen of the balloon fabric spread wrinkled over the floor, was reminiscent of water. After a month, Knight brought the canvas back to Malvern. She sent it to the Air Ministry in February 1942. Another balloon commission was made within weeks. Balloon work had been open to women for six months. In fact, some of the first were former fabric workers, but more recruits were needed. The head of RAF PR thought a night picture would work a treat. Knight herself had come away with some ideas. Up handling guys, slips and bags. Start wind. Start wind. <laughs> In the summer of 1942, she spent a month at a site in Coventry. She was working with another large canvas, but could not take it out of doors. She made many sketches of the operation she had decided to record. The kinds of body depicted in a balloon site are complex. The balloon itself was tricky, 
or is on the move, its surface alive with shifting billows, its mooring ropes and fins constantly mobile. But the operators themselves are problematic too. As we might expect, women were not given a pass to participate in this physical arena of war without extensive commentary on their bodies. Newspapers of the day called them Amazons or Amazon flights, giving the impression that the only women in balloon command were huge hulking creatures. WEFs are now being trained in the handling of the balloon barrage. To help release more men for other operational duties in the RAF, a balloon section of the WAAF is enlisting those sturdy types whom we habitually looked upon as cut out solely for gym mistresses, police women or mothers-in-law. How easily the bodies of these women are dismissed. A Pathy newsreel had also called Laura Knight sturdy some decades earlier. And there she goes, as pretty a launching as you'd see anywhere. What's that saying about the hand that rocks the cable? Mothers were also barred from joining Bloom Command. When the medical people got to think about what we're going to do with these women coming in, they made a decision that if a woman had ever been pregnant, then there was a risk that her reproductive organs may be weakened and there was a risk of rupture or strain. So women who had been pregnant weren't allowed to be balloon operators initially. Balloon sites, which were staffed by 73% women by 1943, could be seen as sites of fear about denatured femininity. The male NCOs had received strict orders not to tolerate indications of lesbianism, and friendships deemed too close would be broken up. In 1942, a balloon site served as a backdrop for a comic film starring music hall duo Revnal and West, whose striking contrast in physique harmonised with the perception of balloon operators as somehow queer. The balloon goes up and up and up in the sky Like the prices in a crisis ever so high Over the city they roll Everything's under control Everything was not under control. It was a hard life. The balloon was better looked after than the girls. They lived in squalid conditions, sleeping in tents or huts. Air Corporal Irene Storer was squadron leader on the site night painted. She wrote a candid account that resonates with the experience of other balloon command works. No coupons for Andy's now. We're in the west. I'm Winnie, the witch on the winch. When I work a witch, it's a cinch. Among all the girls you bet, I am the rage. I hand them all off when I'm locked in my cage. I'm Winnie, the witch on the winch. From my duty, I'll never flinch. The boys in the Air Force all say that I'm class. They all try to kid me whenever they pass. And like all balloons, I know they're full of gas. I'm Winnie, the witch on the winch. I'll tell you a story about um, a WAF told me that she was manning a balloon at um, the docks in Barry. Some seamen came off a ship and um, her balloon site was surrounded by a fence. You have to remember, these women's hands were not in good condition. They'd been handling wire ropes, they'd been splaying ropes, splaying wires. So their hands were all cut to ribbons. And um, these seamen were sort of waving at the WAFs, trying to get a date for the evening and the wafts were ignoring them. So in desperation, one of the um, seamen threw a bottle of nail varnish over into the balloon compound, and the waft picked it up and threw it back because it was of no use to her. If anybody was going to give a respectful representation of the WAFs and the balloon, it was Knight, who had negotiated her own way through the male-dominated art world. She found nobility in the team of heaving women in the foreground, moving with grace and intelligence, in spite of their baggy suits and boots. The balloon and the humans pull from opposite sides of the painting, joined by a skein of ropes hanging slack. Each rope and cable has a name and a place, Knight likened the operators to ants caring for a giant egg. The balloon is slightly deflated, giving it an unpredictable aerodynamic potential. As it rises into the sky, 
expanding hydrogen and atmospheric pressure will transform it into a firm beacon, daring bomber planes to risk their wings in coming close. It was a complicated job. She sent it to London, paint still drying, a year after the commission. It arrived a month too late for the recruitment drive, but delighted the Air Ministry in the work. It became the most famous record of this experimental period, when women were taught to stand their ground, and Britain was kept afloat by inflatables. Hi Lily, can you Hi. hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you so much for the for the film. It was fantastic, and I think just the the sheer variety of the papers that we've had today is just demonstrate how many ways into Laura Knight's work there are, and what an astonishing amount of subjects she covers. And to be able to really zone in on one particular subject, um, as your film did, was incredible. Um, I really want to make sure everyone has a chance to speak before we go into break. So, um, any questions? Uh, in the middle, please. Can I come up here from the front? Oh, yep. Yep. I hope Lily won't mind because I'm not trying to. It, it's a kind of. It's another. Sorry. I think you'll need this mic. I think you? I'll need this mic, yes. If I can just find the page. Um, this is a poem by a wonderful poet by the name of Penelope Shuttle. And it's actually about one of the paintings in the exhibition. And it's now going to take me forever to find the damn thing. And I'm going to be standing here going, I feel really stupid at this point. Um, so you have to forgive me because I should have put a piece of paper in it to remind me. Yes, here we are. Ruby Loftus screwing a breech ring for the Bofors anti-aircraft gun. If you don't know the work of Penelope Shuttle, it's in a book called Leoness, which of course is an old word for Cornwall, and Penelope lives in Cornwall. Green hairnet, red blouse, blue dungarees. This former tobacconist's assistant, no more than 21, girl from a back street, penciled eyebrows, Lots of scarlet lippy, rolled up sleeves, stands at her workbench in command of a huge clattering machine, its calipers, spanners, blocks, the tools of the trade. It usually takes eight years to train for this task. Ruby mastered it in as many weeks. Her hands covered in oil, but steady at the lathe. Virginal gun maker at her work of ordnance. Thank you for that. Thank you, well. um, I've never come across that poem before. I don't know if you had Lily in your research. No, no. I mean, there's a lot of, I think Ruby Loftus is one of the more, is probably her, her most famous war work painting isn't it um and it's certainly very striking and there was a lot of uh, noise made about it and it was a painting that most people seem to have wanted to kind of have hanging in their factories and so on afterwards more so than the barish blue ones but yeah thanks for that thank you again rob uh, i think we have a question about halfway down Thank you so much for this fantastic film. I was always wondering, looking at Laura's paintings, you know, why she was chosen as a war artist and why commissioned painters when you've got photography and filmmaking so to tell the truth. And I 
thought you so beautifully um, showed that actually she is telling the truth through painting and the power of painting telling the truth through your film. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a famous quote, isn't there, by Kenneth Clark, because many people put that question to him, you know, why should we spend money on artists and painters when we've already got photographers and, you know, and filmmakers indeed. Um, but it is interesting, isn't it, to put together the different media, you know, around this particular object or, or kind of practice during the war. Um, and, and just see how easily things are passed off, right, in, in the Pathy News or else that many people would have seen. Um, and and how, you know, how, how she could do something quite different with, with the painting. Yeah, I think Kent Clark said, um, sometimes it takes a poet, I think, um, to sort of say the speak the truth. Uh, question at the front, please. Um, hi, that was brilliant. Sorry, we'll just put you on the mic for the online. Thank you. Hi, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. I've always been, I've th thought a lot about Laura's paintings from this time and the women that she depicted. And I think kind of in retrospect, I think a lot about what happened to those women when the boys came back and the women had to give up their jobs. But before they give up their jobs, they had to train up the men to take over their jobs. I mean, that's, um, and then we moved into the new look fashion that made it impossible for women to do anything in, you know, it was, the control was reinstated. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how Laura felt living to the 1970s to see the women's effort then dismissed in a way and sort of put back a couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, me too. Um, uh, I think you could look at all kinds of areas in which women sort of progressed in independence through the war, right, through war work. Uh, Bloom Command was, was an interesting one because um, women were in charge as well of the sites often um, because they didn't believe in having mixed sites, although you can see some of those photographs, there are men and women in them. Um, so it gave it gave women a taste of what it might be like to have a female boss, which I think was not necessarily <laughs> um, a palatable thing, I'm not sure. Um, but Peter, the historian that I talked to that you see in the, in the video, um, said who has basically had lunch with these women his whole life because every year they, they had a reunion lunch for 50 years after the war finished. Um, how much it, how sort of, how much it shaped their lives, how, mu how much their lives turned a corner uh, into careers. Uh, from from that experience but yeah I don't know what Laura and I thought about it and as has been said she wasn't um she wasn't forthcoming was she with with statements about you know the advance of of equality for women but I'm sure it was there thank you I think we've got a question um from the online audience so we've had a few comments online. They're not really questions, but I thought I'd pass them on. So we've had one from Catherine, um, previous speaker, Catherine. Um, fantastic filmed. Love the way you put it together, Lily. I presume you could not find one of the female barrage balloon operators to interview. Yeah, um, that's true. It would have been great, wouldn't it? Or just some voices would have been lovely, but I haven't found those, um, sadly. But thanks for that. And we've had a comment from Lisa who says, fascinating film and so much I didn't know about women's involvement in the barrage balloons. It was interesting to see the archive letter mentioning the camp hotel and you mentioned that she took the barrage painting back to Malvern. My mother-in-law lived with her at the camp hotel and talked that Laura and Harold were short of commissions during World War II, but she, obviously, but she was obviously bringing things back to her studio from Mal in Malvern. It's nice little yeah. story there. Oh, how wonderful. Um, yes, she seems to have lived there through her, through the war, basically, with, with just a few exceptions of other places that she writes from, certainly in the correspondence I've seen. I'm sure there are other people at the event who know more about the stage of her life than I do. But, um, and of course, that she was one of the people who negotiated hard with the WAC to get a fair price for the war paintings that she did. She wasn't um, on the payroll. I think only one female artist was on the WAC payroll. Everyone else, well, all the other women were, you know, commission, one time commission only, and they worked commission by commission. And she, um, she kept pushing the price up uh, justifiably for her work. 
um, which I think may have benefited others after him. We've had loads of lovely stories, um, particularly from lenders to the exhibition, but also visitors and emails that have come in afterwards of a number of people who met the Knights in Malvern, um, and that very often Laura would uh, make a sketch for the children, or uh, their parents would have recollections of, of um, particularly after Laura came back from Nuremberg, of her talking about the experience um, and, and how traumatic she actually found it but she made a huge impression on these people that she met especially late in life and they've often gone on to become collectors so it's another nice story to add to that list um thank you so much lily uh, i think you, we're going to uh go on a break now for 15 minutes and come back at quarter past four thank you Tea, coffee may be available? <laughs> available somewhere. <laughs>
Well, welcome back and good afternoon. Um, I'm Annette Wickham. I'm the curator of works on paper for the Royal Academy collection. So, of course, uh, Laura Knight is a hugely significant figure at the Royal Academy, and uh, we're very lucky also to have uh, a number of her paintings in the collection, some of which you can see in the exhibition, and uh, a great collection of uh, over 200 of her drawings and sketchbooks as well. Um, but we've heard some um, fantastic insights and analysis so far today of uh, Laura Knight and her career and her work, uh, and also creative responses to her. Uh, but we're moving on uh, this afternoon in the last uh, section to look at her legacy or her legacies. Uh, so we're going to have two papers uh, about that and then followed by a, a poetic response to Laura Knight. Um, so we're going to be uh, having two uh, papers first and then questions afterwards, I should have said. So do keep your questions uh, for, for that session. Um, we're going to be looking at Laura Knight's legacy in a personal sense, of course. It was something she was, she was concerned about. She enjoyed such a, a long and successful career uh, and obviously uh, put a lot of thought into um, forming her reputation during her lifetime and with an eye on, on posterity, especially with the two autobiographies which have been uh, discussed uh, to some extent already. Um, but um, also this is going to touch on uh, her legacy beyond that, uh, beyond her death and um, in the space that was created for female artists who followed her. Um, so the first speaker is uh, Alice Strickland. Alice is a curator for the National Trust in London and the South East. She's the co-lead for the British Art Network's research group, um, British Women Artists, 1750 to 1950, supported by the Paul Mellon Centre and the Tate. Her doctorate considered British women artists of the Second World War, and she was awarded a, a Paul Mellon Research Grant for a publication of women artists of the First World War. Her interest in Laura Knight has culminated in publications including uh, Laura Knight from Ida Down Books in 2019, and she also wrote a chapter in the exhibition catalogue, uh, Laura Knight, a celebration for Penn Lee House's exhibition in 2021. And uh, her title is Creating a Legacy, Dame Laura Knight, RA 1877 to 1970. So please welcome Alice. Um, well, thank you, Annette, for that lovely introduction. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's, it's so wonderful to be here, actually, in person. You never know until the day. Um, I'm really delighted to attend today's conference and to hear all those wonderful papers on that beautiful film. Um, I think it really brought um, Laura Knight to life um, for us all. And I hope that my paper um, this afternoon will really touch on some of the things that you've seen downstairs in the exhibition. Not only her paintings, but I mean her, her dinner service and what the personal things, like I had never seen before the lampshade that she designed for Munnings, um, on name from the Munnings Trust somewhere I've never been. But I think there are just so many wonderful things that I was really surprised by. It's also fantastic to see so many of the works downstairs that you're going to see in my talk um, this afternoon um, at really close quarters. And I mean, for those of you who have seen the Le Morna Birch and just how she handles the paint in there, I don't think my images are going to do um, that any justice, but I think being able to see them together um, is wonderful. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Faye Blanchard and Anthony Spira at Milton Keen Galleries for inviting me to speak and to Shauna Blanchfield um, at Paul Mellon Centre for all her assistance. I'm going to start. Over the course of 80 years, um, from studying at the Nottingham School of Art in the 1890s until her death three days before a large retrospective exhibition at Nottingham Castle Museum and Art Gallery, Laura Knight forged a highly successful artistic career. As she wrote, um, it's been quoted much today, in her first autobiography, Oil Paint and Grease Paint, published in 1936, I am thankful to have known the tasks and struggles of common life, joy and despair like any other mortal. I am just a hard-working woman who longs to pierce the mystery of form and colour. Due to her exceptional talent and unstinting hard work, Knight was able to establish herself as a professional artist, earning a living through her art. Widely celebrated during her, life, during her lifetime for depicting her sitter's working lives, Knight's insistent realism made her one of the most popular artists of the time. 
She always insis insisted that her work was of today, with a capital T, contemporary and real in the sense of depicting the life she saw around her. Knight's contemporary relevance over 50 years since her death continues today through the increased interest in her work and life. In the last two years alone, there's been the, alone, there's been the wonderful um, exhibition down at Penley, which I was very sad not to um, see, Laura Knight, a celebration. The exhibition here um, at Milton Keynes. And then in 2019, there was Annette's and um, Tanner Valentine's wonderful display at the Royal Academy at Laura Knight, A Working Life. It's also through her prominence on the art market. Um, and I don't know if how many of you got to see the Bonham sale, Blazing a Trail, Modern British Women, uh, which was in September 2021. Um, I did go to Bonham's on Bond Street, and this was, I mean, it was really one of the standout uh, works. They're so many incredible, and we've talked about that kind of women artist that she was friends with, um, many of them on show there. Um, and it achieved over half a million pounds, including um, premium at that sale. My paper this afternoon will explore how and why Laura Knight sought to create her own legacy, shaped through her writing, the sitters she chose to capture, the creation of her own image and photographs, through interviews she gave with the press and gifts to collections during her lifetime and following her death. At the same time, she challenged contemporary conventions, a trailblazing professional woman artist. She insisted on fair remuneration, as we've heard. She often depicted people at the peripheries of society and championed fellow women artists, heralding a way for them to pursue their own careers. By shaping her own legacy, she curated her contemporaries with a particular view of herself that she wished to present. It is this character, her work and the world around her, which has colored the way we view her and her works today. And yet for an artist who is, whose life and work is so familiar to many of us here, there still remain discoveries which enrich her legacy and paint a more detailed picture of her. And I was very excited in 2019 to see that the medal that we've heard referred to today, which actually came up for auction at Hanson's. So as I said, her legacy continues um, to develop. This was the National Medal for Success in Art, awarded to Laura Johnson, later Laura Knight, who had become the youngest student to enrol at Nottingham School of Art at the age of 13. An art education was a means for women to earn an independent livelihood alongside creative freedom. And from the 1890s onwards, women formed the majority of all students in Britain. I think at the Slade, it was two thirds of our students were women. The time honored description of amateur was, according to the studio, no longer relevant for a new generation of women artists who, and I quote, devote themselves very seriously to the study and practice of art prompted by a genuine passion for their calling. And as you can see um, on the edge of uh, Laura's medal, it's inscribed uh, with the words, Laura Johnson, subject 8B2, 1893, awarded to her by the Science and Art Department of South Kensington Museum, the later Victorian Albert. And in the same year, the South Kensington Examination Board awarded her the Princess of Wales Scholarship, 20 pounds a year for two years, in honour of her winning the most prizes of all the female students that year and a gold medal from painting from the antique. And as Catherine said, um, she sadly sold that medal and she refers to that, to selling it to a jeweller dealer for five pounds and 10 shillings in her first autobiography, oil paint and, and um, grease paint. Her writings and especially both her autobiographies are key in providing details like this and understanding how Knight sought to create her own legacy, interpreting and presenting her life through her own words. Laura Knight's um, autobiography, Oil Paint and Grease Paint, uh, was first published in February 1936, within days of her historic ele election as a Royal Academician on the 11th of the month. As we've heard today, it's an insightful and personal version of events. And while some dates and memories may be less than accurate, and there are certainly some discrepancies between uh, the words in this book and her second autobiography, The Magic of a Line, published almost 30 years later in 1965, it is very much her record of events, her way of securing her legacy in her own words. In it, she speaks of herself as being, an arts, as being a student for the first 25 or so years of her life, 
from the precociously talented drawings she made at school. I mean, those drawings downstairs are wonderful. I think the first one was with Agnes. I certainly saw it at Maastricht, and it was just, I was blown away by seeing that you know, on a dealer's stand, uh, signed Laura Johnson. It was just, it was a magical moment. It was incredible, and it's wonderful um, downstairs. Um, to the tender depictions of hard-working lives that she depicted in Staithes and Holland. And the certainty she felt when she awoke to the Cornish sunlight, as we've seen today, and the company of artists that enabled her work to blossom. Reviews of her first autobiography were enthusiastic, finding that, and I quote, she had created a portrait of herself in words that is almost as solidly three-dimensional as her own portraits of circus folk. Another found, as vivid as her personality, as vigorous and vital as are her pictures, the book is the woman. Laura Knight was herself a performer, and in her own time, what we would call a celebrity, well able to generate publicity for her work and her accounts of her life. The title of the book seems especially significant when, since the end of the First World War, Knight had made the theatre central to her work and then shifted to concentrate on the circus in the late 1920s. Knight herself doesn't comment explicitly on the book's title, but there is more involved than a simple dialogue between her as a visual artist and the performers who have provided the theme of so many of her most admired paintings. As Timothy Wilcox writes in the exhibition catalogue for Penley, Knight was acknowledging that oil paint and grease paint were not two separate media. Used by different groups of people to different ends, they were both aspects of the same search for identity. And for Knight, the identity that most concerned her was her own. Inside the front cover of All Paint and Grease Paint, in is an image of, and we referred to Harold Knight earlier, uh, this incredible um, portrait of Knight at the age of 14, uh, which um, is housed by the, the Royal Academy. Harold and Laura had met while students at Nottingham School of Art and enjoyed a long and happy marriage. I find it really interesting that this, the, the depiction of herself that she wanted her readers to see in her autobiography was not a self-portrait or contemporary photograph of her, but a portrait by a fellow artist and later her husband when she was a young girl. In her will, it, right, it, it says, to the Royal Academy of Arts of Burlington House Piccadilly, the framed portrait of myself as a young girl at the age of 14, painted by my late husband, Harold Knight, RA. By placing the work within the Royal Academy collection, she was safeguarding the work's future, a work by an artist she believed to be exceptional talent, but who was often overlooked by critics in favour of his wife. And there's a fantastic article on Art UK by Ruth Millington about Harold Knight at the moment. In both Laura Knight's autobiographies, she recalls she'd been excluded as we've heard today, from studying the naked male model or the naked model at art school, a vital component of training and one which was open at the time to her husband. And yet, here in Sketch, we see Laura on her, ele on her election as an associate of the RA in 1927. We view Knight again proclaiming her mastery of the nude, showing her artistic abilities in spite of her lack of early training from the nude which she overcame working with models, including Ellen Napper and Eileen Mayo. And this work, again, depicts Eileen Mayo. Um, I think it's blue and gold of 1927. I'm quite willing to be challenged on that, or someone else came up with it. But I don't think it's on view downstairs, unless I missed it, maybe. Um, Knight is showing sketch readers that she's a professional artist, palette in hand, standing beside an easel with a life-size portrait of her sitter. She's creating an image of herself in the press, tackling subjects which hadn't been open to her and fellow women art students. And it's interesting, I think, that during this period of the 1920s, she was fascinated with depicting the ballet. So it's interesting that instead of showcasing a ballet work of the time, she chooses this work to mark her election as an associate in the press. The Royal Academy was an institution that played a critical role in her career in legacy, in how she has been viewed, the work she exhibited, commissions she gained, her remuneration, and ultimately, the depository for a large holding of works from the studio. In 1922, some five years previously to Knight's election as ARA, Annie Swinnerton became an associate, the first woman to be admitted since Mary Moser and Angelica Kaufman. In her autobiography, Oil Paint and Grease Paint, Knight acknowledges her debt. 
Any woman reaching the heights in the fine arts had been almost unknown until Mrs Swinnerton came and broke down the barriers of prejudice. A prejudice natural enough, for a woman's life is set in another direction. Throughout her career, Knight was drawn to women working in creative fields, dancers, actors and artists. And whilst Knight's status as the only the second female Royal Academician since its foundation often implies her isolation as a woman artist, her portraits demonstrate that she worked within a strong network of professional women. One of her favourite models was Eileen Mayo, and she's now the subject of an Ida Down Press um, book uh, that's just been published, um, and also an exhibition at the Towner Gallery in Eastbourne uh, that opens on the 12th of February. Mayo appeared in many of her iconic paintings, The Golden Girl and Dressing for the Ballet. And she also appears uh, with Laura Knight in the Pathé film, Mrs. Laura Knight, the famous artist, which marked her election of ARA. Knight is shown in that film, working in her studio. In fact, a film set dressed for the occasion and in conversation with Eileen. In paintings such as this work, The Maiden, and comparable works, including Dawn, the RA, given by Laura Knight as her diploma work, Knight defiantly celebrates the female form and her individual spirit. And this is also one of the works um, that she, um, uh, sorry, I was put off by the five minutes, I'm being so huge, um, that she um, uses to illustrate in oil paint um, and grease paint. <clears throat> Eileen Mayo also modelled for Knight's great friend and fellow ARA, um, uh, Dodd Proctor, um, and I think that Dodd Proctor had a huge influence on Knight, particularly her painting Morning, which is held by Tate, uh, that was shown at the RA. Um, I think that comes through in Susie in the Wash Basin, uh, which is downstairs, and I think you know, it, it's huge on this screen, and when you see it, it's just such a beautiful uh, depiction of this young um, girl. Knight's own legacy is inextricably linked with fellow women artists, and their legacy as professional women artists in the first half of the 20th century. Throughout Knight's long career, the Royal Academy served as an important venue, a forum for establishing her legacy, for showcasing her work both to her peers, potential clients, and the general public. And I'm showing um, a work that's all very familiar to you uh, now, having seen the exhibition at Le Mourne Birch in 1934 um, on Varnishing Day. And you can see Harold Knight, the figure to the left, um, unless it's got cut off, no, um, uh, smoking a pipe, looking directly um, at us. And it's also interesting, here she is standing by it, which gives some sense of scale to those who haven't seen it. Um, but it's also interesting that it's hung on the line. Uh, works could be easily viewed, even when the room was crowded at that position. But the work also has a special significance to her legacy, in that she gifted it to the University of Nottingham in 1968, shortly before her death. Her fond association with Nottingham and her time as an artist there, a student there. And as you um, can see, the work um, was in gestation for a rather a long time. Some nine years after her election as an ARA, Knight was elected a full Royal Academician in February 1936. And the work that she chose as her diploma work upon her election is this painting, in which she proclaims uh, her mastery of the nude. And this was really at the heart of um, Annette and Helen's um, uh, display at the Royal Academy. And as Annette writes in the Royal Academy of Arts, an incredible book um, that was published in 2018, although not explicitly stated, there was clearly an expectation that a diploma work which every newly elected academician had to prevent, uh, present for approval by the president and council should be representative. The choice was up to the individual artists and was inevitably influenced by many competing considerations, ranging from an artist's interest in posterity to the more prosaic factors, such as the number of unsold works in the studio. And so it's interesting that she presents this work as her um, diploma work, the women sitters taking on a symbolic significance, representing the hope each new day brings. Following her election, as Knight recalls, an army of pressmen and photographers camped outside her studio. And her election was marked by a commission from one of the leading society photographers of the time, Alexander Bassano in which she adopts a variety of guises. And I'm only showing you a few. They were taken on the 20th of February, 1936. They're on the National Portrait Gallery's um, website. Uh, so do go and have a look at them. And what I loved about the ones that I've chosen here is I think they're really evocative of her ballet russe's uh, work, the dress, I thought, in particular, on the, the left. For 18 years, from 1911 until the final appearance of the ballet russe in 1929, 
um, Knight was very heavily involved with them and was commissioned to design the costumes for the ballet Lorraises in 1924. Following her election as RA, the Society of Women Artists held a dinner in her honour to celebrate her achievement. The silver salver that you're seeing here was given to Laura Knight by the um, Society of Women Artists upon her election to the RA. And I have to say thank you to Annette for kindly taking a photograph um, of it. Um, whilst I was reading uh, the wonderful book, Royal Academy of Arts, um, I actually came across something that I'd long, I'd long hoped that I would uh, find um, when I read, following the deeply rooted tradition of marking membership of the RA with a gift of perceived value and shared collective purpose, Knight significantly bequeathed to the Academy on her death in 1970, the silver platter that she had been given by the Society of Women Artists 34 years earlier. And it's actually specified that in her will. The inscription on the platter reads, I was wrought for the Society of Women Artists as a token of affection for their president, Dame Laura Knight. And the Society of Women Artists occupies a unique position as both the earliest and oldest surviving exhibiting society for women artists in Great Britain. And during the 1920s and 1930s, when Knight was so prominent, the Society um, regularly sent invitations to many well-known women painters and sculptors to encourage them to exhibit work. And many of these were exhibitors at the Royal Academy Annual Exhibition. In 1930, an extraordinary general meeting of the Society resolved that an eminent outsider be invited to be president. And two years after this resolution was improved, Laura Knight was elected the SWA's first and only honorary president with Dorothea Sharp, another woman artist I'm sure you're all very familiar with, especially her beach scenes, um, as secretary. <clears throat> A year after her election at an exhibition of women artists work at Henley in 1933, Knight stated that while she believed it did not matter at all whether a picture was by a man or a woman, Women do need some special encouragement from time to time. She graced the office of president until 1968, the SWA's longest serving president from 1932 to 68, and then she became a patron, exhibiting right up to her death in 1970. And if you're interested in finding out more, Goldsmiths hold an incredible archive of all their catalogues and, and some of their and papers. Sadly, a lot of those were destroyed uh, during the Second World War. During the early years of her time as president um, and shortly after her election as a Royal Academician, um, as we've heard, she was um, commissioned by the War Artists Advisory Committee. And in total, 17 of Knight's works uh, were acquired by the government. Less than 10% of the War Artists Advisory Committee's work during the Second World War was by women. And the only other woman, and the only woman employed on a full-time salaried basis was Evelyn Dunbar. Knight's Second World War Commission, an art artistically and incredibly significant body of work, are also important for how she champions um, fair remuneration as a professional artist, a legacy for women artists, both contemporary and succeeding her. Knight, and it comes across in the letters that are held in the Imperial War Museum, had real faith in the worth of her work, both artistically and finan financially. They offer an interesting insight into her working methods and the importance she placed on achieving the financial reward she felt was her due. And like I said, I don't think this does any um, uh, benefit to the work when you actually see it downstairs, especially the perspective. In 1941, Knight was invited by the Air Ministry to paint um, women's auxiliary Air Force balloon fabric workers employed in the maintenance and inspection of barrage balloons. She wrote, I have not heard what remuneration for this work is likely to be, but trust that the offer will be more on a more generous scale than for my portraits. The work's entailed a monetary loss for me. Much as I enjoy doing this work, I shall find it difficult to continue painting more at such a fee. I should love to do this work, and I do hope you will seriously consider what I've just told you. So this is customary wrangle throughout her commissions, um, and she was finally offered um, 100 guineas for her barrage balloon uh, commission. Um, and the work so impressed the Air Ministry that she was then commissioned to um, paint a balloon site Coventry of 1943. Downstairs amongst one of the um, exhibits um, is this work, War Pictures by British um, Artists. Um, and Knight was um, commissioned to write the introduction um, for this in 1943, in which she writes, with many others, 
women will have their place side by side with those of sailors, soldiers and the airmen when the artist's record of the war is complete. As her war works illustrate, she was an inveterate recorder of the people around her, those she met and befriended. And I was really um, pleased to see a proper circus, Omi, which is on display downstairs, which I think is one of her lesser known um, works um, and an illustration from inside it. And there's so much more of, legacy, of Knight's legacy um, to discover. I remember, more years than I wish to remember, um, going up to Nottingham and actually seeing the typed notes from this book. And they're beautifully, some of them are handwritten, they're annotated um, as well. So I think there's so much more about her manuscripts um, um, that, could be, that could be explored. A few years after the publication of A Circus Amy, um, she published The Magic of a Line in 1965 at the age of 87. Written with the same perception, zest and subtlety of observation as her first book, it's more reflective in tone. Knight embellished her now well-rehearsed rags to riches story with a description of her career over the past 30 years. It became a bestseller and had been reprinted twice by the end of that year. Both autobiographies show Knight taking control of her own professional identity through what Rosie Broadley, the curator for the National Portrait Gallery, Laura Knight Portraits, wrote, her negotiation with the mainstream male-dominated art establishment served to pave the way for greater professional recognition and status for women in the arts. The autobiography was published to coincide with her retrospective in the diploma galleries at the Royal Academy of Arts, which included over 250 works covering all periods of her life. A reviewer of the exhibition in the Times wrote, few women artists have delved so widely into the curiosities of life around them and painted what they saw with such observant and transparent delight. And one of the works, again, which you'll all be very familiar with downstairs is Spring. And I think it's wonderful how you always feel like you're walking into that work, how it's hung um, downstairs. And this was shown at the 1965 exhibition. And Knight was forever interested in curating her own displays and works. And there's a lovely letter that she writes to the characters in here, Charles and Ellen Appa, uh, that we see. Um, she wrote, the old spring picture has been yanked out of the Tate. Age has not wrinkled either the paint or yourselves. And for me, I think just seeing that work um, downstairs really shows the best of night, encapsulating all the elements that her works are so well regarded for colour and tone, but in this incredible Cornish um, landscape. And I wanted to finish with a couple of photographs again from the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, that were taken three years before her death in 1970 by the society photographer, Madame Yvonne. And I think in these works, you get a real sense of her choreographing her own image. She was always adept at promoting herself in the press and Knight accelerated this process during her later years, presenting an image of an energetic woman who was still a significant force within the British art scene. In The Magic of a Line, she conjures up an evocative image of her studio shown here at 16 Langford Place, St John's Wood, London. Every drawer, every shelf, every cupboard, still stuffed with sketchbooks and drawings from 50 years ago, sitting aside, alongside those made only so long ago as yesterday, she wrote. On her death in 1970, Knight's executors discovered among her papers her annotation on a letter dating from 1952 in which she pledged to donate her large store of drawings to the Royal Academy. 26 sketchbooks, along with 290 loose drawings from Knight Studio were given. I feel very lucky to have seen just a fraction of those at the Royal Academy, and they're an especially important legacy as they, date, as they range in date from 1916 to 1960 and demonstrate her full range of drawing techniques and enduring engagement with her favorite subjects, landscapes in Cornwall and the Malvern Hills, to the circus, the ballet, and the theatre, which you can see amongst the works here. I hope you've enjoyed hearing how Laura Knight sought to shape her own legacy throughout her career. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. That was really fascinating. I loved those photographs of uh, Laura Knight, both in the 1930s and uh, in the 1960s as well, they're so um, glamorous. Um, it was also fascinating to hear about the different methods through which uh, Laura Knight was able to take control of her own reputation and to uh, cement 
her status as a, a fully professional uh, woman artist. Um, the next paper is uh, going to be by Hester Wesley, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, Like a Half-Rolled Map, Tracing the Borders of Female Self-Narration in the Careers of Laura Knight and Subsequent Women Artists. Uh, Hester interviews for Artists' Lives, National Life Stories at the British Library. Her recent research focuses on intersectional histories of female self-narration. She was formerly Goodison Fellow for the National Life Stories, uh, 2016 to 17, and she favours modes of dissemination that highlight the orality of her methodology. Um, highlights from her publications include Art Education for the Many, Clifford Ellis and the Founding of Caution, The Many Lives of the, the Life Room, Expanding the Boundaries, The New Creativity in Art Education, and she co-curated Reception, Rupture and Return, The Model in the Life Room, 1890 to uh, the present at Tate Britain, 2014 to 15. So thank you very much, Hester. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and um, just to hear the range of perspectives that the papers have offered today. It's been really fascinating. It's a gorgeous exhibition. I felt quite emotional walking in this morning to see all um, Knight's paintings brought together like this, where it's a real treat for Milton Keynes. So let's see if I can work the clicker. Ah. Is there something? Ah, here we go. We're up and running. As a Life Story interviewer for the Artists' Lives Archive at National Life Stories, an oral history fieldwork charity based in the British Library, I reflect on the question of legacy constantly. Our aim at National Life Stories is to disentangle public rehearsed narratives from personal recounting. We now hold 417 and counting life, stories, life story recordings of artists. Distinguishing these recordings from other interviews is the forensic approach to the interviewing process that the founder of Artists' Lives, Cathy Courtney, has insisted upon since she began the project in 1990. Artists' Lives recordings are many hours long and recorded over months or years. These unparalleled audio testimonies offer researchers a treasure trove of what Clifford Gertz termed thick descriptions. Such thick descriptions provide cultural context and meaning to human actions and behaviour. They are immediate, unrehearsed and subjective. As historical documents, they are as fallible as any memory, yet they reveal a compelling sense of the shifting subject positions of the speaker. Therefore, they must be treated with the same respect as any archival artefact. But what these recordings do achieve, something that no other historical document can achieve, is that they give the artist the last word about who they are and what they want from their art practice. And that's exactly what I want to do this afternoon. I want to give Laura Knight the last word. And here she is. So, these things, they've never been put down. In this recording, made with Laura Knight in 1968, not long before her death, and now held in the Royal Academy Archive, who are kindly letting us play the audio here today, Knight cautions the interviewer and us, her future audience, about the subjects she's revealing about herself. So these things have never been put down, she confesses. Just what is it about the recorded voice that makes it such a compelling medium, able to capture the stuff of humanity that often hasn't, or won't, or can't be written down? As historians, we piece together fragments of archived remains from a variety of sources, both primary and secondary, doing so with perhaps the quixotic aim of a complete person. On our quest to get closer to night, to bridge that historical chasm between her era and our own, we pore over her calligraphy and correspondence, 
We scrutinise her choice of anecdote in her aut autobiographies and we ponder the photographs of her studied costume. And most importantly of all, perhaps, we try to grasp that elusive gaze depicted in her self-portraits. We try to glimpse behind the veil of performativity that Knight crafted to grasp the true nature of the woman, the artist. But until I had, as it were, sat with Knight, listened to the cadence of her voice on this recording as she lights her cigarettes, clatters her teacup and saucer, until I had appreciated the sheer effort of speaking for her because she is literally gasping for every breath until I had understood that every utterance she makes is an emphatic revealing of her truth. It was only then, through the intimacy of audio, with no visual distractions, that I truly felt as though I could hear her across the historical divide. I had got, I, being a woman, at the old school in Nottingham, which is all the tuition I ever had. No woman was allowed to draw from the nude. Yes. There was no class for the nude. And you can't learn to draw. You can't draw unless you know the there's nothing like the human figure. No, because they're all the muscles and everything. In this short audio excerpt, we glean so much about Knight's personal struggle on her journey to make herself. From this thumbnail account, we understand the gendered exclusions that shaped her formative years, indeed her whole life. Even more, we understand her fundamental point of departure for her practice, drawing the human figure, and sheer commitment to mastering that skill. In her public persona, Laura Knight never acknowledged the prejudice heaped upon her throughout her life she always performed her public image. She had a prophetic understanding of artist as brand. From her compelling self-portrait, and this really is self-representation as personal manifesto, Knight also performed her subjectivity through text. Her autobiographies, Oil Paint and Grease Paint, first published in 1936, were penned at the height of her personal fame, the same year she was elected as Royal Academician. These volumes' writing style is jovial and upbeat. And the portfolio of portrait photos she commissioned at the time reveal the image of herself she wished to project to the world, confident, wry, even imperious in a gaze that invites at the same time as it dismisses. It's worth taking a moment to put Knight's accomplishment at the Royal Academy into perspective. Let's listen to a comment made by the former secretary of the Royal Academy, Sidney Hutchinson, in his own Artists' Live recording. Here, he recalls the first time women joined the annual dinner of Royal Academicians. The dining tradition at the RA was exclusively male until 1967. So this indulgence meant that Knight had been a Royal Academician for 31 years before she was allowed to attend the Royal Academy dinner. Oh, and by the way, that, at that dinner, it was the first time uh, that women were, were present. It was just a few distinguished ladies, including at, at long last Dame Laura Knight and other women members of the Academy uh, who had been denied attending the dinner, which was an all-male function uh, up to that time. So why does an artist choose to speak more frankly on a taped recording? Knight was certainly thinking about posterity when she decided to speak about her experiences on tape. But I believe it's more than that. Perhaps it's the sense of the permanence of the page or the words becoming typeface that discourages the openness that we find in our audio recordings. In no small sense, in conversation, words exist only as long as the sounds they make, which means, really, that the interview can be a liberatory experience. The artist's interview is predicated on a trusting rapport between the subject and the interviewer, and it's this approach which elicits the sometimes startlingly raw and immediate reflections that give us unprecedented 
access to the psyche of the artist in question. In effect, artists' lives recordings offer origins. These are the original voices of the original actors in their original historical moment. With that voice come the subtleties of irony, satire, sincerity, pain and vulnerability that is simply impossible to capture in a transcript or written text. When we interview for artists' lives, we're not asking for a memoir. We're asking the subject to speak without rehearsal, and thus we capture those nuances in real time. Knight's recording is hugely moving. She lingers on undiscussed trauma, the tragedies of childhood, the challenges her mother faced rearing her children as a single mother, the painful episode of the premature death of her sister, Laura's own suicide attempt. What emerges, and this point is particularly apposite in the instance of women artists, is that the recording blurs the boundaries between the public and private spheres of the artist. These barriers are particularly policed around the production of art. And in the pacey anecdotal style that characterises her autobiographies, Knight refrains from addressing the thorny issues that, that around her trajectory as a woman artist in a man's world, for obvious fear of alienating her readership. In the recorded conversation, and through this erasure of the boundary between the personal and public, she reveals the true nature of personal challenges faced and sacrifices made in the name of artistic production. A keen example of this quasi-confessional style is Knight's revealing of the complexities of being married to fellow artist Harold Knight. A familiar theme, inevitably, of our recordings of artists' lives, and especially in the testimony of women artists, is the sacrifices made in order to maintain their practice. It's a truth seemingly universally acknowledged that being a woman artist comes at a hugely high price in personal terms. But in Knight's audio retelling, we find that the inverse is true. Her account of Harold is a sad story of many women artists, and Laura's remorse is almost palpable. And Harold won everything he could went in for. He was the most brilliant student that had ever been known. But I stood in his way. You did? No. Yes. I stood in his way is a refrain that's repeated in the recording as Laura explains the impact of her success on her husband's practice and mental health. It's a far cry from the uncomplicated impression of unity that we find in Laura's autobiography, where actually Harold has little mention, and Laura's biography, where Harold's role as Laura's idol, mentor, and partner of decades does little to shine light on the complex dynamics of a couple where the wife outshines her husband in an era where women were supposed to remain in the shadows. Do you think Harold minded? He never showed it. Never showed it. Of course he did. And then on top of that, had a hideous nervous breakdown. We were in a doctor's house who was doing him some good but not curing him. For about two years. Oh. Able to, not, not able to paint. We had nowhere to paint. Were you painting then? Yes. You were. So you were earning the money? He never knew it. No. He never knew. As Laura's reflections remind us, the recorded conversation is the moment to say much that has been left unsaid, sometimes for decades, and most times never. But it's also not just what is said, how something is said or what is left unsaid can be the most powerful signifier. The recorded conversation 
captures complicity between the interviewer and interviewee, which in itself can be revealing of other ideas. In her recording, Laura swaps unexplained loaded euphemisms. The audio silence and receptive lacuna can be maddening. In this rich exchange, Laura explains why she and Harold didn't have a family. He must have been a remarkable man. He was a marvellous man. You had a very happy married life, didn't you? Yes. Well, you have unhappiness because of stupidity. Me too. And lack of understanding. That always happens. Yes. You never had a family? No. I was born wrong. Sorry? I was born wrong. I never had a proper nurse. Being born wrong. This statement is as terse as it is evasive. Knight repeats it with emphasis, but the ambiguity remains. Is this a claim about biology, psychology, sexuality? It's frustrating, of course, that the interviewer doesn't give Laura the opportunity to expand upon a moment she clearly feels confident about addressing. Despite this moment, and what a moment to have asked a question, what we must remember is that this interview has created a space for Laura to speak frankly about the issues that defined her as an artist. Just as the recorded interview creates a space for women artists to explore issues of identity, we find that this methodology mirrors the practice itself. In Laura's own words, as well as in the testimony of women artists who have followed her, we find their insistence upon personal practice, not merely as the site of expression, as is so often described by our male artists, but also as the site of refuge, in this next slide, we will hear a short extract from the artist Eileen Cooper, a self-confessed admirer of Laura Knight's painting and one of the very few women artists to have followed Knight into the dizzy heights of RA officialdom because Cooper was the only woman to have served as the keeper of the Royal Academy schools. Here she situates the origins of her compulsion to draw and paint in the early days of her childhood in her view, one of the primary functions of her art practice itself is to enable her to enter a different sphere. I don't know. I think I had it in me somehow. And somebody unlocked a door for me, probably my mum, through doing drawings. And it was a lovely, quiet time that I had with my mum and a real escape. And I still find that it's an escape from my worries. You know, I can go into the studio feeling weighted down, but it, it doesn't stay with me. I'm not like an angry expressionist who needs to get the anger out. Through working, I find an equilibrium and I'm on a journey then of, of um, you know, partly discovery, problem solving, Yeah, it was, it's, it's something that you do which take, trans, transports you. The modernist vision of the interconnectedness of life and art aside, Cooper is signalling here more than a coalescing of art and life, but a total identification between practice and being. The studio, or the act of painting itself, becomes a survival strategy. The act of practice as a life force is a theme that not only recurs in our recordings with women artists, but is one that characterised Knight's writing of the self. As her biographer put it, when Knight couldn't work, she became ill. Work was her resource, her life. And the carpet's figure continues. My recording of the painter Anna Teasdale leads to her regarding her practice as a metaphor for navigating the perils of life itself. I think or I have found myself in so many situations that are not quite ideal. That's why 
I look for the best in any situation. And I think that's what I do in my painting. Because if you look at it, you'll see it's, it's well sorted. Everything's sorted out. So if there's a great mess of hedgerow and bramble and tree branches and grass and weeds, I'll get in there and organise it a bit. I'll see the rhythms that go through it and emphasise them and the way things grow. In fact, what I do is... I make, like John the Baptist, I make the rough places smooth. So I think, I, I think I've always done that in my painting. That's what I do. I remember sort of sitting in the life room and seeing massive models who were sort of great mounds of flesh and so on, and thinking, now I've got to sort this out sort it out and that's yeah I think that's what I do so whatever the situation if you try to make the best of it and see the best in it really it, it carries you that outlook carries you right through life Perhaps Laura Knight wrote her own epitaph in her autobiography when she, in typically self-effacing fashion, played down her own election to the Royal Academy by lauding the achievement of her predecessor, the now little known Mrs Swinnerton. We women who have the good fortune to be born later than Mrs Swinnerton profit by her accomplishments. Any woman reaching the height in the fine arts had almost been unknown until Mrs Swinnerton came and broke down the barriers of prejudice, a prejudice natural enough, for woman's life is set in another direction. There have been few who could devote their life to the arts. Thank you. Thank you, Hester. Um, it was amazing to hear the voices. Um, should we sit down here? Yes. Amazing to hear those voices and, and that incredibly <coughs> candid um, interview with Laura Knight towards the end of her life. You can hear her smoking <laughs> as she speaks. It uh, you know, really brings her so much closer, doesn't it? And thank you both for those fantastic papers and insights into how um, Laura Knight as you say, sort of performed this, uh, this image of herself and created uh, her own brand. Um, I wondered actually, firstly, if you thought that that sort of sense of performativity actually got in the way of her legacy? I mean, do you think she succeeded for posterity? I mean, in the sense that um, this fantastic exhibition is taking place now, which uh, is a, a great um, step, I suppose, in, in, in her legacy. Uh, but for a long time, I suppose she wasn't taken entirely seriously, as we were discussing earlier. And, and I just wondered how both of you thought that her efforts to position herself actually affected that posthumously. Well, I have a stab first, Alice. Go on, um, <laughs> It's a difficult one. I mean, I feel that the generation of Laura Knight and some of her amazing peers who've been mentioned today, like Dodd Proctor, um, you know, were on the wrong side of history because mm. they were... Um, entrenched in a in a practice in in figuration, you know, in a way of teaching that had existed since the Renaissance, and um, the tide had turned, you know, and and I think that um, so in a sense they were sort of out of step, and so they were always in that sense. I think their their legacy for the 20th century was fairly doomed, mm. um, especially with you know the post-war institutionalisation of the avant-garde. Mm. But you know that's what, that's what is so exciting about this moment actually mm. is because it's a very inclusive moment, 
and we are interested in plurality. There is no one history of art anymore. We've got space for women who wanted to paint other women. Um, and, and these paintings are being taken out of the storerooms. I mean, I remember discovering Laura Knight as a schoolgirl in Penley Museum and, um, and never having seen them anywhere else. And, and you know, and, and, and it's, it's taken this long, actually, to, to bring her back. But it's, yeah, an exciting time. And I don't think it was to do with her own uh, carving out of her own identity. In, in, in that sense, I would argue that she was actually very prophetic. It's that mm. idea of artist as brand. Yes. She was before her time. Mm. I just think, yes, she, was, she came at a very difficult kind of moment. Mm. Um, where the tide was against her, really. Yes. Anyway, Alice, I don't know. Well, I mean, things, you know, the art market goes in and out of fashion, doesn't it? And I think with women artists, it's interesting, I was just speaking to Sarah Hardy, who's curator at the De Morgan Foundation, um, and the kind of women artists that are kind of becoming more fashionable. And I often think that actually, yes, did Knight die out in a commercial sense? I don't think she did, actually. I think commercial dealers still continued to sell at very high prices during the 20th century. And I, I sometimes think there's a, a disconnect there as well between what happens in public galleries, what happens in private dealerships, in private collections. So, you know, artists fall in and out of favor, don't they? Male and female, regardless of, of gender. I think we see that, we see that the whole time. And at a, a point in time, someone is incredibly fashionable. I mean, look at Paula Rigo. So, yeah, there's waves, aren't there, I think. Yes, and, and the celebrity and... Um, yeah popularity itself, I suppose, as you were saying, with the um, sense of the emerging avant-garde that just um, worked against her <laughs> to some <laughs> extent. Um, but do we have any um, questions from the audience? Anyone would like to come in on that? Yes, in the middle. Yes, I was wondering, because uh, obviously quite a few of the pictures in the gallery are of men. Uh, and we've not really had any sort of explanation today of whether people think her depiction of men is successful. And I wouldn't necessarily ask that anyway, because I think particularly that the picture of uh, <clears throat> the two mechanics in the end room, I think is a wonderful way in which a woman can depict men at work in that attitude. <coughs> And so I wouldn't necessarily question that, but it does seem to me a, a tendency to think that only women can paint successfully women, and I guess by reverse, men can only paint successfully men because they are, th are the only ones that can really sh have the experience of their own sex. And I mean, have I misinterpreted some of the things that have been said today or not? Um, I just think she's an extraordinary painter of men and women, mm. equally. I, yeah. don't, I, 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 I don't think... I think the question of the kind of gendered gaze is, is, is slightly aside from her, you know, just virtuosity um, as a draftswoman. And I would say, you know, I, th I, I often think, gosh, you know, if we talk about her fame, but it was fairly short-lived, actually, her moment in the limelight in her own lifetime. And if, you know, if you think about her equivalent... Um, reputation to somebody like Augustus John, who would have, you know, uh, she was she was never going to achieve the kind of recognition then. I think because her subject matter was pr primarily women and women often of marginalised communities, working women, circus performers, gypsies. Um, but I think her representations of of men are equally um, astounding, actually, and sympathetic. Yeah. And Augustus John, I think, is a really good talking about fashion. Mm. I mean, he fell massively out of fashion, didn't he, towards the, you know, the end of his career. And seeing that survey it makes me feel very old. But the one at Tate, mm. um, they did, gosh, it must have been 20 something years ago, with him and Gwen. And I think, you know, he didn't come off well against her, but also that his later portraits definitely fell out. I mean, he fell hugely out of fashion. Yeah. I think there's been a resurgence in him now and understanding. I think Philip Moulds, you know, another commercial dealer, has done a lot to. To kind of pick up Augustus John. Um, yeah. Any any other questions, Sarah? <laughs> it was it was great to uh, hear Knight's voice and that yeah. the legacy or the trace of her Midlands accent as well was still there at the end of her her life. But just thinking, um, 
She had a marvellous turn of phrase, and it's interesting that she published two autobiographies, which is really unusual, isn't it? And I just wondered um, whether you knew, either of you, how that came about, or whether she had sort of a particular relationship with publishers, because she obviously knew the power of the printed page and to translate her words, as well as her drawings, onto the page and then disseminate that more widely through a more popular press. But I just thought that's a really interesting kind of technique, in a way, of, of publishing her work more widely. Mm. And the timing of both of them is yeah, uh, and going <laughs> quite sort of impressive. Beyond, yeah, beyond the walls of the gallery. Yeah. I can't answer that question, actually, Sarah, but I, do th I did read, actually, I think it's in her biography, that she was very put out because the pub um, when the first um, volume was reprinted, in, it was in the war, I think, this, the, the Penguin. It's the lovely, three the three volume, yeah, out. I love that. Um, she was, she, the, the sales weren't good, and she was very attuned to that, as we know. Um, it just didn't sell as well. Um, but no, I've... I've been racking my brains to think of another woman artist who actually wrote an autobiography in the 20th century. Maybe somebody can help me out with that. Oh, yeah, of oh, course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but another woman who fell out. I mean, there wasn't much known about her until Charleston, I guess, in the mm, recent exhibition. Mm. Did Carrington? There's that wonderful Noel Carrington book on her life, but I don't know. Dora Carrington. Mm. I think one of the great Bardfield artists, but then it wasn't just her. Oh, it is Argarwood did. Yes, but it didn't she? Of course. Mm, yes, that's what it was about the whole community. Yeah. Yes. Think, yeah. What's really interesting as well, I think, is if you flick through some of the because it was obviously fashionable to do amongst her male contemporaries again to write. They they all wrote their memoirs, didn't they? We've all you know flicked through <laughs> Johns and Epstein's, but if you look and Munnings, if you look through their autobiographies, they give her fleeting reference. And she was such a central point character in their lives. So I think that's quite telling, the omissions, actually. Um, yeah. You, you OK. That's interesting. Oh, Eileen Agar, yeah, yeah. who was actually the first woman to be recorded for the Artists Live Archive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think you both mentioned Harold as well, and I mean that that was very interesting the dynamic there because I mean, she clearly was a very competitive person, and yet in the autobiography she presents it as a very harmonious relationship, and that they you know weren't particularly competitive with each other. That you know, but that seemed very different. I think she came across as being incredibly sensitive mm. to his difficult situation um, mm. and it must have been for him because he obviously was you know mm. a highly skilled artist in his own right mm. and um but she outshone him and i i just thought it was incredibly poignant actually the mm. way she you know she said he never he never knew perhaps he did know but then he mm. couldn't acknowledge her contribution mm. um but certainly i think that you know their partnership was long and um obviously mutually supportive i mean that portrait we saw somebody showed the beautiful portrait that harold made of laura as an adolescent. Yeah. I mean, he'd known her since she was a child. Mm. Um, but yes, we don't really know. We've never mind the depths of their <laughs> relationship. I think it was probably a lot more complicated than anybody yeah. has um, breached today. But mm. Well, yes, your, <laughs> the recordings seem to suggest that. <laughs> it was a question that another thing was that he was a conscientious objector, mm. and that made life very difficult during the First World War. And the couple were actually um, moved to St. Ives for a brief time, but I think that put an extra layer mm. of um, problems, you know, difficulties in their way. Yeah, there's a really good, so I was saying an article in Art UK, and I think it is entitled something like Harold Knight, Pacifist Painter. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Any further questions? I think we might might wrap up but thank you very much both oh, of you very fascinating papers oh sorry, sorry. Just very quickly. Mm. Um, I was born wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. can we go there yeah well absolutely and <laughs> I throw it out to everybody because I think that's really open to mm. interpretation isn't it and that's um but it's a very definite statement mm. that she's making and she repeats it so um I mean I think we could take that in various directions 
Um, as I said, you know, is it about biology? Was it about nurture? Because she does make that comment afterwards, doesn't she? She said, I didn't have a nurse. I didn't have a proper nurse. Mm. But is it about her sexuality? Mm. Um, and, and that's the moment, you know, as an interview, you just think, how could you not have pursued <laughs> that? Because she, was, mm. she, she opened that up for discussion, so, but, um, yeah, intriguing. Yes. Does anybody else have a, a reading of that that they want to share? Yeah? Oh, I think you might need the, um, the mic. <laughs> it's coming. And you've got to remember that in 1890, 1900, when she was a young woman, mm. and when she married Knight, that there was very little available, they didn't have a lot of money, so it was private practice, and maybe she went to a doctor before she married Harold, and mm. there was a problem with what my grandmother called her insides or her female parts, mm. and that was why, and I think that's what she's referring to, but I don't know much about Harold, he's always a shadowy figure, and maybe, and he had a nervous breakdown for two years, she doesn't quite say when that was, mm. But I was also intrigued by her voice, especially what emphysema does to your mm. voice. She could hardly speak. Mm. And that was very, very sad, I must say. But that, that, that's my observation. It's, it's kind of logical. Mm. Yes, I'd assumed it was physical, but then she says this comment about the nurse, which makes you... Yeah, makes you think it might be something else. <laughs> Alice, did you have any? No, no but I mean, I'm just, just thinking, mm. you know, there are many women also have spoken about the pram in the hall, haven't mm. they? So you, you can speculate as to yeah. what children would have done with her career. So. Yeah, might yeah. have been harder to travel with the circus. Yes. <laughs> so, or maybe not. She sounds like a woman who didn't indulge in regret. Mm. Yeah. And just had to keep going forward. Yeah. 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 Yeah very much that sense of her sort of keeping her curiosity in life and um, and focus all the way through this very long career as well which um, you know which came out from both of your papers too oh well, actually I had a question for mm. Alice about mm. you mentioned that she was interested in curating her mm. own exhibitions can you what can you tell us about that well I, was, I mean know? I just made that I didn't even have it on my notes actually but it just kind of came to me I was thinking about the 1965 exhibition where she's writing to Charles and Ellen Apper and she's saying about you know, where works are displayed. I think that happens also at Nottingham before she mm. dies. I mean, I think that's the kind of artist as curator of their own works is quite an interesting. I mean, again, there's so much to explore, isn't there? I, mean, I think that would be a fascinating thing mm. to, to look into about how she curated her, her own works and what she valued as well. Mm. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you both and thank, every, thank you everyone for listening and for all the questions. Um, we're going to end today uh, with a poetic response uh, to tomorrow night from Damien Labas called uh, The Broken Tongue. Uh, Damien is a writer from the south coast of England. His first book was The Stopping Pieces, A Journey Through Gypsy Britain, which won the Somerset Maugham Award, uh, Jerwood Award, uh, Radio 4 Book of the Week, and was shortlisted for the Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year. And his next book is due to be published by Chateau and Windus in 2023. Uh, Damien's former editor of Traveller's Times and a regular broadcaster, presenting the critically acclaimed BBC film A Very British History, Romany Gypsies in 2019. He's a native speaker of the Romany Gypsy language and a keen scuba diver, hill walker and year-round outdoor swimmer. He lives in Worthing, the seaside town where he grew up with his wife, actor and writer Candice Nergard. And he read theology at St. John's College, Oxford, graduating with the highest first in his year in 2006. <laughs> so, uh, welcome, Damien. Thank, will this pick me up like this? Yeah. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's been, firstly, it was astonishing to see all the work. Um, I'd written about a few of the pieces years ago, but I'd never been face to face with any of them. And now I want to see them all again, having listened to and, and seen what we've heard and seen today. A wonderful privilege, I'm sure everyone agrees, to have been here. 
um, the broken tongue is a title I chose for this short bit for two reasons. Um, it's the English translation of the phrase poggity jib, which is a name for the, the anglo romany language, as academics like to call it. Um, its speakers don't tend to call it that, they call it Romanus or Romany, the Romany language, the traveller's language, anything but what academics call it, basically. Um, and it's possible, actually, that poggity jib or the broken tongue is a sort of romantic and intellectual's coinage that comes from somebody who learned the language but, but wasn't a native speaker. Uh, but the other reason that I thought I'd use the, the term or the phrase is because I wanted to acknowledge the voices of, of those whose words come to us broken or hazily or not at all. And for me, perhaps as a writer, that's often in the background when I look at so many of Laura Knight's paintings and, and drawings. So, uh, yes, a couple of poems that, two of which are, I think, directly inspired by Laura Knight and one that isn't. This one I wrote nearly 10 years ago, so I wasn't sure whether to read this because sometimes old work makes me feel a bit ill, but um, I'd, I'd written a, a short piece about Laura Knight and Alfred Munnings and, and their paintings of Romany people. Uh, and then I was commissioned to write this to accompany the Museum of East Anglian Life's Gypsy and Traveller collections, uh, where different eras of, of accommodation are displayed from the Bender tent through to the traditional horse-drawn wagon, sort of everyone's probably mental image of how Romany gypsies live, but actually was, was only the main form of habitation for about 100 years, from about 1850 to about 1950. Um, up to, to modern trailers. And I thought about generations of, of Romany women, particularly the, the women in my family, whom, whom the women in this poem are sort of inspirations for, I think. This is called Reflections. Great Granny pauses by the silvers, silver whites, and starry greys of running water by her wicker basket. It is early in the year and in the day. New minted yellow sovereigns, emerald bottle tops, and melted stained glass windows seem to bloom and melt and blossom on the stream like droplets from a vision, from a dream, or even heaven. She lifts the basket anvil heavy with the sodden children's clothes, walks to the bender's hazel ribs, its high crossed flue, its hollows. Granny pauses by the russets, hot maroons and royal greens that flood across the wagon mirrors, graven crystal glass. Morning is now unfurled outside. The summer somewhere up the road will take the cherry reds the bosom warming heat haze that she coaxes into life inside the stove and let it fall on England by her roadsides in her meadows. She treads a soundless step towards the lace and shutters of the door, toward the coming noontide. It is hers, the lands, her peoples. Mother walks on cobbles quickly, halts, and pauses as a flash of silver flows round red enamelled letters in the window in the street. High noon has pitched her here by coral, peach and yellow tones of buttered scones and lardy cakes. Madeira, cottage loaves, her little threepence won't buy much. Her ragged clothes buy titters from the schoolgirls on the terrace. Hungry, defiant, sad brown eyes 
stop searing tears with stinging pride. She runs. Back at the camp, the wagon's axles lie in ashes. Her eyes stare at her as she dusts the chrome, the glass, the mirrored doors. A cushy bit of flash, they call it. The horse is gone. The growling diesel engine pulls the stubborn on. Metal and glass are bright but cold, she thinks, then pauses. Could have sworn that grass and sky were mingling in the corner of her eye. She scowls. Banknotes on the table, trailer on the tarmac. She reaches for the silver frame that traps great granny's kindly stare. Underneath its black and whiteness, deeper greens and blues are there. Um, this isn't directly inspired by Dame Laura Knight, but I hope in a way she'd approve of, of me reading, or at least permit me to do so, um, because I think, uh, I mean, this is uh, called Song of a Yetum Queen, and it's an imagining, really, of the thoughts of Esther Far Blythe of Kirk Yetum, who was known as a queen of the Scottish Romany Gypsies. Queen, not in the sense that she ruled over anybody, but it's a term of esteem uh, for, for her as a character and of her lineage. Um, the name Far being the surname of the first Romany people to arrive in Britain at, at the end of the 15th century. Living light is for butterflies, the old folk dressed as such, furs flanking the abdomen, painted parts to real glances like fishes, and wings of survivors' arrogance to flap to futures with stuffed purses. Such is the story. I balk at its purity, breathing the sky and derived from my mother. Bemused to discover, my skin brought controversy, free of deliberate feint at transaction, I knelt before no one. I scrutinised Scotland, measured my steps from the dawn to the pavement strewn in my palm like the seed of a parable, falling with speed that adjusted for willingness. I was taught well how life lurches to bitterness, how a sin sown in the wild may sprout in the city where judges' jaws snap like the guillotines. Heir to cautions, I keep tales of a sentence. Mind bailiffs, they'll confiscate necklace and cattle. They hanged five in Durham for being our kind. So, settled as much as I'm tented in bricks, a caste state, far-fetched, curiosity. I pack out my mind shelves with blood books and kin songs and feel in the back muscles running by spine side the strength of hill ranges like backs of old goddesses, ridged like beast backbones and notched like the Eildons. My window lets light like the windows of wagons or boats beached in yards resting miles from seaways, and down to my nest of old age, deed and costliness, swallows and bats bring their loop lines of tidings that tell of the quiets, that follow the cryings, that follow the hidings, that follow the ridings. Um, this, uh, I'm afraid I need to do a quick primer before this one. Um, which I wrote for today. Um, this, it contains a bit of the aforementioned poggity jib, the, my, my mother tongue, my other mother tongue. I mean, English is my mother tongue, but so is the, the English Romany language. So um, what have we got here? Uh, dick means to look or see. Vastas are hands. A uh, putsi or putzel is a pocket, and rupni means silver. Kakar means sort of leave off in this context, forget that. Uh, and rye mushes are uh, really well off, typically sort of 
upper class men who, who take a shine to gypsies. Mui, mui means mouth, vonga means money, and to, to shav is to go quickly, to run. Uh, Dikadoi means to look there, and awava bersh means another year. Uh, and the word rawni means a, a, a woman of status, and the word nav means name. Now, of course, I don't expect you to remember all that, but it might might help with this. Um, I'll, I'll read it again in a in sort of impure English afterwards. I've called this Mrs. Knight, the painter Rawney, and that's an imagining of how the two anonym anonymous Romany women depicted by Knight at Ascot races uh, may have referred to her based on the way, for instance, my great-grandmother uh, refers to uh, women whom, whom she esteems, uh, but also sort of thinks are of a, of a different social class, I think. But it's an imagining. Mrs Knight, the painter, Rawney. She hollered us over at Ascot when the sun was up over the track, and I offered to dick at her vastas if the lady would give something back. But she drew out a brush from a putsy by the flash of the Rutney Rolls Royce, and she showed us a smile, and she gave us a choice to be painted. And I trusted her and thought, that'd be cushy. They said, Kaka, she's like the rhyme mushes, who lures mooies for vonger then shavs. But we dicked her a doughy, a waver al besh, and the rawney remembered our navs. So it means um, she called us over at, at Ascot when the sun was up over the track, and I offered to look at her hand if the lady would give something back. But she took out a brush from her pocket by the flash of the silver Rolls Royce, and she showed us a smile and she gave us a choice to be painted, and I trusted her and I thought that would be lovely. They said, so I imagine other travellers having an opinion, um, she's like the, the posh men who will steal your face to earn money for themselves and then go and you'll never hear from them again. But we saw her there another year and she had remembered our names. And I think that the presence of the names with so many of these pictures is, is, is telling of Knight's personality. And the absence of the names with those paintings that inspired that, I've sort of conjured a fanciful backstory that actually she did know them, but was asked not to include them, which is another possibility, I think. Anyway, thank you very much for the invitation and for today. Thank you to Damien for those evocative pieces and to uh, all of the speakers and contributors today and uh, hope everyone can join us downstairs for a drink uh, to toast Laura Knight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.